Okay, good evening members. It's uh, 6.30 according to the town hall clock, so we better make a start. Um, the webcast has started, so good evening and welcome to the uh, November meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Members and officers are reminded to put their mobile phone or electronic device on silent. Uh, if they have one near them and not to place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Please for remote participants mute microphones when not speaking as this will reduce feedback and uh, background noise. Members of the council joining us remotely should leave cameras on. After each item has been presented I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of the overview and scrutiny committee present in the room will be making the decisions and I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching on the webcast. So, welcome everybody and first item on the agenda, minutes. Do I have your authorisation as chairman of the committee to sign the uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of October 2022 is a correct record of those proceedings. Move, Chair. Thank you very much. Apologies and substitutes. I think we're all here. Are we? Are we here? Additional agenda items. Uh, disclosure of interest. Any members have any disclosure of interest they feel they need to make? All depends. Councillor Cortell. A member of the Bexhill Environment Group. Um, I don't think they'll be happy with me by the end of the evening, sadly. I will. <laughs> Councillor John Barnes. Director of a rather district council housing company. I don't think anything on this agenda is that will be prejudicial. I think it will be personal. Councillor Gray. I'm also a member of Bexhill Environmental Group. Yep, okay. Good, good. good. Uh, Item five, medium term financial plan 2023, 24 to 20, 27 to 2028. 20, um, yeah. To review the financial issues affecting the council and their impact on the financial forecast for five years ending 27, 28. Um, you'll see the officer recommendations there. Um, Tony, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid this isn't going to be a particularly um, uh, a rosy picture to paint. I'm sure that's not going to come as a, as a huge surprise. I'll, I'll just quickly run through what the, uh, the, the proposals are to, uh, for when Cabinet uh, consider the report in a couple of weeks. So, so note the medium-term financial plan and the proposed way forward. Uh, maintain the council tax policy of a £5 or 2% increase. And you probably guessed that uh, the report was written, published and finished before the uh, the. Uh, Chancellor's announcement last week, but just to uh, let members know that the decision to or the ability to be able to raise council tax by 3% doesn't actually have an awful lot of uh, impact on the council's ability to raise further council tax income. It would probably net it or yield about an extra £30,000 a year, uh, which would be helpful, but it's not going to um, uh, make a big difference or make a big hole in the 2.2 the million deficit that's laid out in the, in the medium term financial plan for next year. Uh, so, amongst the other um, proposals was to delegate budget consultation to the Chief Financer and Councillor Giawan, who is the uh, portfolio holder for finance, as you know, uh, and also to, be, to continue to be part of the East Sussex business rates pool. Uh, just to explain, uh, Chair, and apologies if uh, members are already familiar with this, uh, being in this pool, it allows us um, to keep any, a proportion of any business rates growth uh, that we, uh, we receive. Uh, rather than have to give all of it back to central government. I don't know what the figure is off the top of my head. I can find out. It doesn't make a huge amount, but it does uh, pay us, if you like, to remain in the business rates pool. So I propose that we continue to do so. Uh, more importantly, I think uh, there's a piece in the report um, 
that uh, explains that there's a need to develop savings proposals. And this is uh, in addition to the, the financial stability programme that the council has already put in place. Uh, and what I'm trying to do with these proposals, and what I think we need to go with these proposals, is that I want to keep re uh, reserves at a, a figure of around about five million and for us not to dip below that. Now, there's no uh, statute or anything like that that says it must be five million. There's no um, figure or calculation. It is a judgment of the chief finance officer as to what the uh, minimum level of reserves should be. Uh, now, there's a piece in the report, or there's a paragraph in the report about a paper that our external auditors did uh, a while ago, and it was, uh, it was on the back of a public, uh, several public interest reports that had been released. Uh, and within that paper, uh, their advice was that min um, earmarked reserves should be a minimum of 5%, preferably between 5 and 10% of uh, a council's net expenditure. Now, for us, 10% uh, of our um, net expenditure is around about £1.5 million. Pounds. Now, it should, there's two things I'd like to point out there. The first thing is that uh, that's a very blunt measure that Grant Thornton have used. Um, so it doesn't necessarily apply for every single council. It can't necessarily apply for every single council because we're all different. You know, the organ every organisation is very <coughs> different. Uh, the reason why I think we need to keep it up to five million is if you go, if you cast your mind back to the to the pandemic. Now we incurred some emergency costs, um, for example, support to Freedom Leisure, uh, Delaware Pavilion. Our expenditure was about £3.3 .3 million higher than what we uh, had initially budgeted. And the government covered most of that, but not quite all of it, but it did cover most of it. Uh, but nonetheless, there was the need to put that money up front, if you like. So keeping us at a level of £5 million is really, it's designed to make us not shock-proof, but we've got to be able to deal with shocks. I think it's fairly safe to say that COVID was a shock. Uh, and we've had more since. And there's no guarantee that we won't have more going forward. So for me... Uh, you'll see uh, in Appendix A that the reserves dwindled to, I think, around about 2.8 million by the end of the five-year forecast, and that uh, is, a, is, a, is a critically low level. There is also a little bit here, as uh, for us as a council, we have to um, it's, we, we have to convince the auditors that we have an adequate level of reserves. And if you if you look at other uh, other places where where there've been public interest reports, and I won't name uh, councils individually, that's not fair, but. Um, very often they come on the back of a critical, uh, inter, uh, critical external audit value for money report. Uh, am I okay to carry it, continue? Yep. Uh, yep. I'm just indicating that I Okay, thank you. Um, and I've lost my thread now, what was I saying? So yes, so uh, uh, it, it, they've come on the back of critical, uh, often come on the back of critical external audit reports. So this is also not just about um, We've, we've got to give assurance to the council taxpayer of, of rather, of course, but we've also got to give our external auditors assurances as well. So the headline numbers, as I say, the 23-24 deficit is predicted at 2.2 million, and that can be seen in Appendix A. Uh, and the deficit does reduce to uh, a, a much more minimal amount by 27-28, by about 120,000. And that's mainly because we have uh, an expectation that there will be additional rental income coming from the property investment strategy, but also that inflation won't continue at the high rates that we're currently seeing. Uh, and I've taken that uh, advice on the back of advice from our Treasury uh, management advisors. Uh, but they are only predictions, and members need to bear, bear that in mind, and we, we are still living uh, economically in quite volatile times. Uh, so... The situation, if you cast your mind back to a year ago, I think we were, we were looking at about a 1.2 million deficit for 23-24, and now it's increased by, uh, by an extra million pounds. And um, I think those reasons are fairly obvious why that's the case. Um, I, I do want to say a little bit about the capital programme in Appendix C. There's nothing that we've added to the, to the capital programme, uh, but what I do think the Council needs to do going forward, because of the volatility in interest rates, uh, we need to be looking at each particular capital scheme, particularly the big ones anyway. We need to look at, uh, review each capital scheme that we go ahead with. Uh, we need to review that for affordability because the rates still fluctuate. Uh, yeah, even as we speak now, they fluctuate sometimes by 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a percentage point. We ideally want those rates to settle and we hope that we will get some, some setting of the rates in the, in the market going forward. Uh, but as I say, we need to keep these, pro these big projects under review uh, uh, for affordability. Um, on the local government funding its settlement itself, uh, as far as we know, it's, uh, uh, Michael Gove announced during the summer that we would be uh, uh, 
receiving a two-year settlement, and that is still the case as far as I know, but we will get the settlement uh, around about the middle of next month, so we'll know more then. Um, in terms of the fair funding review, which has been on the, on the cards for quite some time now, I, I really can't add anything further to that at the moment. I think uh, hopefully we'll know more when the settlement comes out next month. A little bit about the cost pressures that the council are, are facing. I think this is not really going to come as a surprise to anybody. Inflation is one that's really hitting us. If we take the waste collection contract, for example, uh, there's a formula built into that contract, which uh, uh, means that essentially we're paying an extra £400,000 a year as a result of the, uh, of the uh, uh, contraction increase. Uh, but it's by no means the only problem that faces the council. We've got an increase in homelessness costs, despite the, um, the better efforts of, uh, of Joe Powell and his team and the Temporary Accommodation Purchase Programme. Uh, we've been able to mitigate some of the costs, but it's not the price that's causing the problem now. It's more less so the price, but it's more so the volume. Uh, and hopefully Joe will, uh, uh, if asked, can, can add a little bit more around that. Uh, we expect our external audit fees to go up by £100,000 a year. Uh, I'm afraid that's not really come as any surprise either because the auditors, in terms of continue, uh, performing their audits right the way across the country, uh, they've been late for, for quite some time now. And uh, the reason for that has been that uh, they feel that they've not got adequate resources to, to, to do the audits within the timescales required. So we were expecting an increase. Uh, I think that will be, be the case. Uh, I've left uh, the budget contingency of £200,000 in the financial plan. Now, if we didn't spend that £200,000, that gives you about a million pounds back in your reserves straight away. Uh, but I think it's turned out to be quite a sensible thing to do, uh, certainly in the current financial year when we come to do the quarter two forecast report in a minute. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that uh, tactic, if you like, of, uh, of having a contingency has, has, has helped as well, will help as well this financial year. And it's probably prudent that we continue to keep that in there whilst the economic picture is so uncertain. Uh, so paragraph 22 in the report sort of opens up the debate, if you like, on making further savings in addition to the financial stability programme. And it's important to note that we have made progress on the, on the financial stability programme, but um, the, the FSP was more about protecting discretionary services and trying to come up with income generation ideas and, and, and delivering efficiencies. I think really where we're going now uh, is that we're going to have to make more sort of direct decisions about service provision. And that will probably mean that we have to make some service, uh, service cuts if we're to deliver those savings. I don't think it's critical that we deliver them for 23-24, but it's certainly critical that we start working it now. I've not attached any sort of target number or anything like that because I think we need to have discussions uh, with, um, with senior management uh, who will then work up proposals for members to consider. But we certainly do need to be, uh, start thinking about doing something about it now. Um, I think I've, I've already talked about business rates. I've nothing further to add there. The, the government grant funding, if you look in, in Appendix A, we've made an assessment that we think our grant income will fall by around about £250,000, £300,000 a year. That's mainly because we don't really know what's going to happen. With uh, There's a table in paragraph 26 that hopefully um, uh, illustrates that a bit clearer. And it's mainly because we don't really know what's going to happen with the new homes bonus grant. The government have sort of threatened for a couple of years that they, they will do away with the NHB grant. Um, we got money that we weren't planning on last year, uh, which was great news, but I just don't know what's going to happen this year, and they haven't indicated whether there's any predecessor to new homes bonus. So it may be a case of um, the, the CFO being unduly pessimistic there, uh, but it's best to be that way, I suspect, than, uh, than be too optimistic at the moment. And council tax, I did cover it a little bit at the beginning. Uh, it may be... It, it, it will be... Informed that it will be 3%, the ability will be to increase it by 3%. The MTFP, um, in, in the past two years, the, uh, before going into a referendum, you've had the choice of raising by 2% or £5 on an average band D price, if you like. Uh, that was down to councils to decide that. If we went for 3%, that gives us around about £30,000 a year more on council tax income. So that change from 2 to 3% doesn't really uh, make an awful lot of difference. When we come to do the report again in January, as part of phase two of the, uh, the budget process, we will, of course, update the numbers. But unfortunately, that's not going to be enough to bail us out of the, uh, the situation <coughs> that we have. And that's really uh, as much as I want to say. There is a little bit, sorry, I've, I've, mentioned all, I've already mentioned about the budget consultation piece. So, Chair, that's probably a, a, as much as I can say at the moment. Um, as I say, it is a, a, a bleak picture. Um, I, I will say that... Uh, 
the one good thing about well, not really one good thing about it, but the, the, the one thing we have got in our favour is that we have a plan and we know that there's a problem and we have given ourselves time to do something about it. But we have got to act now. We've got to do something about it now. Um, I, I say in, in a lot of cases in, in, in these public interest reports, it's like that the, the, the problem hasn't been foreseen. We know there's a problem. So that, that, is some, that should provide members with some comfort. But um, as I say, be under no illusion, there's some tough decisions that are going to need to be made over the next few uh, weeks and months. Mm. Thanks, Tony. Um, I know Councillor um, Barnes indicated, but Councillor Cortell, you put some questions in to Tony. Did you want to go through those um, and, and the answers? I have to go through those. Yeah, just as a starting point, and then, you know, as, as you, know, you may well ask, Councillor Barnes may well ask the same question that you've got the answer to already. So if, if you want to kick off first. Thank you very much, there. Chair. Uh, the first question I asked Tony was what would be the effect of raising the provision for staff pay increases uh, to the same level as the provision for inflation in non-staff costs? And that would be 4.57% instead of 3% in 23-24. And his answer was it would add 90,000 to the budget requirement for 23-24 and approximately 150,000 for a full year effect. Um, the second question I asked um, Tony was what would be the impact of a council tax reduction scheme of 100% and he said the rather element would be about 77,000. Um, the third question I asked Tony was what would be the impact of the 3% were allowed to increase uh, council tax by without a referendum and he mentioned 30,000 which is what he told you a minute or two ago. Um, I then moved on to um, the uh, my concern about the level of reserves and um, the uh, fact that the external auditors, Grant Thornton, indicated that the 5 to 10 percent level was sufficient uh, as a buffer and that the 10 percent level, as Tony said, comes to about 1.5 million um, as opposed to the 5 million that Tony is advising. Now, Tony made it quite clear to me that um, he could issue a Section 114 notice, which would, um, deprive, uh, which would deprive the um, uh, uh, us of any discretionary services. We, that they could be cut completely. That he pointed out that we're not there yet, but that we could. Um, end up in that position if we don't take action. Um, I was very much hoping we could come to a compromise of something in between the 1.5 million of Grant Thornton and Tony's 5 million. And he points out that we're, uh, at the end of the forecast period we'd have 2.8 million in reserves. Um, I don't think Tony considers that a sufficient buffer. He won't tell, uh, tell us w at what point he'd issue a Section 114 notice, but it sounds as if he would if we don't carry out some cuts. Um, I would... Um, uh, cuts to services, that is, which is very worrying. Now, uh, if we go a lot, along uh, towards the end of the meeting where we have the environment report, um, there's a proposal to increase uh, the budget, the environment budget by £218,000 to have hydrogenated... Point of information, to... Chairman, point of information, if I can. Yeah. I think the statement is misleading. The recommendation is not that the, uh, the HBO be introduced for a cost of £218,000. It's an option for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then um, I noticed that that report was due to be noted and I therefore assumed that it was uh, part of what we would accept but um, 
glad to hear it's an option for discussion. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's a very attractive option. I ju I'm, I'm just concerned what will we have to cut back in order to achieve that. Um, so, uh, basically, um, I, 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 I would, I've, I've got the number of aspirations, as um, you probably noticed, staff costs, council tax reduction scheme, um, hydrogenated vegetable oil, but I fear that in the present circumstances, whatever we aspire to ameliorate, we'll have to cut somewhere else. And that is very, very worrying. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, did you want to come back on, on those and just clarify some points? Thank you, Chair, if, if I may. Um, I, I don't want to sound like a power crazy lunatic, but this isn't really something for, for, for us to compromise on. This is my professional judgment as the Council Session 151 officer that I think five million is the minimum that we should be looking to, to retain. Um, it's not that I won't give an answer to uh, when I'd call a Section 114 notice, as I don't know. Uh, and I don't really want to, to ever have to do it, and I don't anticipate having to do it, because I think we can put a plan in place. But as I, as I say, to be clear, this isn't something for, for dis I'm sorry, this point isn't something for discussion. I've got to be very clear about that. This is my judgment. That's what you pay me to do. That's what you pay me to make, make decisions like that. So I'm sorry, I can't shift on that, and I won't shift on it. But we, I've, we do need to be in close discussion with, with officers and members about how we keep to that five million. I think also I explained quite clearly during my um, my introduction <coughs> of the report that I know the pandemic was is viewed as a once in a hopefully once in a generation uh, and be, beyond that type of occurrence. But we're experiencing economic shocks all the time. Uh, there's other global factors that are at play as well. So we need to be resilient to those and. For example, if the interest rates did go up against expectations and we aren't able to deliver some of those uh, schemes in our property investment strategy, that's going to place more pressure on the budget because we won't be able to achieve those, uh, those rental incomes. So, sorry, it's, it's just not for a compromise, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, think the, I think the point was made as well. You said that the external auditors would expect a higher level Otherwise, the external auditors are the ones who can then, if they think you haven't got enough, uh, you know, an, enough reserves and, and you're not working on improving the reserves, they're the ones who then recommend that they, they, they call the government in to, to take you over, ultimately. Um, so that's not a position we want to we be in. So that's hence the reason Tony is, is pretty solid, as we can see, on, on the sort of third of our uh, budget being available for the exceptionally rainy day that we had a couple of years ago. So um, I think that's right. Um, Councillor Barnes. Yes, can I begin by commenting on the reserves? There are currently eight councils in this country uh, that actually uh, have lower reserves than 32 or 33 percent. Every other council keeps at least a third of its total spend. Um, our total spend at the moment is 50 million, so keeping five is uh, spot on to 15. I frankly find it slightly surprising. Uh, that it's as low as that. I've been a chairman of various charities. We are encouraged to keep 50%, six months running cost. And indeed, uh, when you actually look at most public bodies, they tend to keep uh, rather more than uh, a third. Um, but six months running costs is still... A pretty thin margin. A third <coughs> looks quite solid at five million, but it's very easily eroded. Um, and currently, I would remind you, for the last two years, uh, we have actually been running down the reserves at three million a year. Now, we're planning to do that less by building up income and finding savings, but we have not been terribly successful at finding savings, 
we've been rather more successful at building up income. Um, there are certain assumptions in here. It's, let, let me finish on reserves for a moment. I think we should be saying to the Cabinet in no uncertain terms uh, that we should keep a minimum of a third of total income or five million, whichever is the lesser. And I propose to move later on uh, that that is the case. Um, because I think uh, we do need to express that view very clearly. Um, as far as I can see, and it would be helpful, I think, if when we take this paper to Cabinet, the figures are teased out uh, slightly more. As far as I can see, the totally unavoidable rising costs this year is about 800,000 plus 98,000 for the auditors and about 88,000 on energy. In other words, built into this is an unavoidable rise of uh, a million pounds. Uh, so instead of running at 15 million, as we are at the moment, if we did nothing, our running costs would go up to 16 million. And when I look at the Appendix A, I find one of the ways that we're going to run down is that our net financing costs are actually going to be budgeted at close on half of what we budgeted uh, in the current year. Now, that implies a very large slippage in our capital program or a reduction in projects. Tony, can I ask that question? Yeah, my chair. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing to predict financing costs, um, Councillor Barnes, but I'll try my best to, uh, to, to explain where the, where the logic's come from. I think in the past, we have probably um, overrated the pudding, if you like, and, and we've assumed that all the, spend, the capital spend is going to happen in a, a particular year, and it hasn't done. So it is partly due to slippage, as you, as you pointed out, but also um, we've actually got we've got a, a capital receipt from um, uh, from the same amount. I think I'm right in saying so. We've got some capital receipts that have built up that we can use to offset some of the uh, the capital <coughs> expenditures. So if we can use our capital receipts, uh, that clearly mean, negates the need to borrowing um, uh, to borrow. Uh, there is also uh, with the increase in interest rates, whilst it makes borrowing more expensive, it does actually mean we get some investment income on our on our uh, deposit <coughs> accounts, which we. Uh, we, we, I mean, it's been such a negligible rate. We've had nothing over the last couple of years. So there's a combination of factors uh, that, have, uh, that, have, uh, that have enabled us to make, a, I would say, a better informed forecast. I note your pessimism then leads you to almost double it in the following year. Uh, so I... <laughs> either, either the capital programme is going to slip and then roll on, or you're anticipating rise in interest rates, or both? It's a little bit of both, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I follow the logic, but uh, I'm a little uneasy by, about uh, quite so radical uh, an assumption um, in the current year coming. Um, now, staffing costs seem to me uh, the major thing for any local authority. And we found this year in the end uh, that we couldn't hold to our original intention of only offering 1%. Um, inflation is not going to die away that fast next year. It probably will be down to single figures by halfway through the year. It might, if we're very lucky, be down to about five, four or five percent by the end of next year. So two years of inflation, and at the moment what we've done is pay our staff at the bottom end about seven percent, uh, but we've been able to do that for a part year cost. Um, I'm assuming that we're going again for a part year cost, but we're assuming a pay settlement of 3%? Yeah, 
Yeah, that, that, that's correct, Chair. But just, just to be clear, th these are my estimates of what the pay settlement will be. They don't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it's going to be, as we found out this year. Uh, I think with regards to inflation, inflation is, is, is again, it, at the, certainly at the moment, it's a very fluid and tricky thing to actually try and pin down as to what it's going to be uh, uh, going forward. Um, we will review the, uh, this is, as I said before, this is phase one of the budget process. We will review uh, many of the assumptions within the report as part of phase two. And there may well be that some of these numbers change. Uh, but that's not because of uh, um, um, errors or anything like that. It's just as we get better information as, as, the, economic, as the, um, uh, the, the government funding settlement, for example, unwinds, or we, we work with more up-to-date information. The problem is, I'm afraid, Chair, is that uh, we're going to be setting a budget, pretty much we're going to be, have to land on a number by, uh, by January, and then by April it will probably all change, and that's just the nature of the beast. It's trying to predict what's going to happen in 18 months' time, when, frankly, at the moment, it's difficult enough trying to predict what's happening in 18 days' time. And that's, uh, that's uh, an inherent risk with any budgeting, I'm afraid. I think Turner's just made my case uh, for actually thinking we need to be erring slightly more pessimistically at the moment in our forecasts um, and probably putting more contingency aside. Um, otherwise, we're, we're going to eat into our reserves pretty fast. I, I genuinely... I think we've got two forecasts at the moment, Bank of England and the OBR, quite apart from the private forecasters. The OBR is rather more optimistic than the bank, but both of them suggest a pretty high inflation rate uh, throughout most of next year. I think we need to uh, bear that in mind when we're budgeting. I'm assuming on the whole we've made a realistic yes, estimate. Just, can, on... I, can I just come back on it? If I may, um, with inflation, measuring inflation, there are various indices, various different ways of doing it, and they don't all necessarily, uh, not every single um, inflation indice index applies to, to the council. So it's a bit of a balancing act trying to choose the right one. Um, but uh, there was another point I was going to make, but it's, it's passed, passed, me, uh, passed me by, Chair, so I apologise. Um, if, I, if I think of it again, I'll, 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 um, I'll come back to it. But I think with regards to what you were saying about uh, what Councillor Barnes was saying about uh, painting a more pessimistic picture, this is what I was going to say. Um, I think this is why we need, this is why I'm very keen that we start addressing the savings issue now. Because we could, we don't, we, we, it may well get worse, the situation may well get worse, we hope not, but it may well do. But we need to give ourselves that, uh, that sort of ability to, to absorb the shock. Uh, and hence, if we start that savings exercise now, we increase our ability to do that. Uh, we don't want to be making decisions on service provision uh, based on assumptions or based on forecasts that actually don't come to, to light and are more pessimistic than what we first expected. So I totally understand Council Barnes's point, and I, and I agree with him as well, but it is a very difficult balancing act, and that's why I think the emphasis needs to be on whether, not so much on the accuracy of what we think the forecasts are now, but that, uh, that process of identifying savings going forward, because it then gives us the ability to, uh, to absorb those shocks should they occur. Yeah, you think, uh, um, turn I think, it. Can I just, just bring Lorna in a minute to, on, just on savings? Thank you, Chair. I um, absolutely agree with Tony that actually now is the time to start identifying those savings, working with services, working through the options that we have. That's obviously going to be a difficult process, but I think the sooner we start that, um, the sooner we'll have an idea of what our options are around savings. And then it will be a political decision on where we go, um, but gathering those savings, we are putting resource behind that, working with services. Um, we've got a small team of officers together who will be working with each team to identify savings. And as I say, um, it will be subject to, um, we have to understand the implications of those savings and make sure that actually they're not unintended consequences of those savings. So it takes a little bit of time to pull it together. But the sooner we start that process, the better prepared we are for the future and just to let you know that that process is about to start. Um, so, yeah. Yes, I, I know we're doing non-budgetary inflation at about 4.5%, 4.57%. Um, I think we will be very lucky not to face a strike um, if we don't actually put a realistic figure in for pay this year. Um, and um, I think, therefore... 
Yes, you can probably do it by putting in contingency so you don't commit. But I think we need a realistic contingency uh, for pay this year. We're going to be asked to back date again, and I don't think we shall be able to afford that if we're going to be able to pay the right sort of uh, level of pay increase. Given the likely impact on real wages, uh, which has now been downwards for some little time. Um, we're assuming, and again I'd like Tony to confirm the figure, uh, that having saved about half a million this year, we're going to be able to save about two and a half million in uh, the remaining years of this program each year. Um, now that's an ongoing savings, so obviously um, it may build up a little over time, uh, but we seem to be assuming that that will cut in fairly early. Um, is two and a half about where we're aiming? If I may again, Chair, thank you. Uh, that's a good point, actually. I probably should have mentioned that during my, my little preamble. Uh, that's a situation that we're keeping under review. Uh, and I'll be discussing with, um, with the Deputy Chief Executive going forward. We do need to, you're absolutely right, we need, we need to review that. I can't really say one way or the other which way it's going to, you know, what those figures might, might look like. It's something that we will review as part of Phase 2 of the Budget, and that was, uh, that was always the intention. I think I'm right in saying that uh, the Deputy Chief Executive has, since I wrote the report and published it, has had some further discussions uh, around... Uh, around devolution, so it was always a bit of a fluid position. It's just important to bear in mind that this is our first, uh, if you like, first stab at it, uh, and um, a very valid point, and we'll keep, the, we'll keep that under review. It's, it's, it's making these valid points um, at this stage of budgeting. I, I do think we need to uh, be very realistic in our approach to this year's budget. Um, I'm not criticising Tony at all for vagueness because uh, it is an extremely uncertain situation. There is another about which I will say very little because um, I, I, it's why I declared an interest. But we have got a number of building projects on hand. Uh, the infrastructure for Blackfriars. Uh, Blackfriars we hope to be building uh, next year. Uh, we've got King Offer and one or two others around. Any one of those going wrong uh, could knock our finances quite hard. Um, so, again, that is something to be borne in mind, uh, that those are some of the big shocks um, which, given the state of the housing market, might go wrong on us. I'm very hopeful they won't. Uh, because I think we will still need houses and I think people will go on therefore acquiring houses. But I have to say those shocks uh, could generate some quite alarming figures um, if they go badly wrong and that also needs to be borne in mind. I think Chairman, I've said enough. I, I, I wouldn't disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think somewhere in, in I think I'm, I'm sure I see it somewhere in here that, that Tony said each each sort of capital program will be as it comes up will be looked at and, and re-evaluated. Is that right, Tony? Yeah, that, that is absolutely right. It doesn't um, detract from uh, the point that Councillor Barnes has made. Uh, we we have got vulnerabilities there. Again, I'll make the point about the, the importance of raising, uh, of uh, identifying savings and, uh, and another plan to absorb those shocks. But it absolutely, absolutely is the case that we need to um, be looking at these, uh, uh, the, the big schemes, anyway, the multi-million pound schemes, if you like, for affordability as and when they, they arise. Uh, it, it, you know, for, for example, it's possible that we may bot want to choose to borrow short term whilst we wait for the longer term rates to, to, um, to, to settle down. That, that, that sort of thing. And I think that the key here for us is going to be uh, you know, really good close treasury management and, manage, and, and sort of better information around our future cash flows as well. Uh, but that, that's absolutely the case. I think um, I can't stress that enough. I hope I brought that out in the report quite clearly that we will be needing to look at the big uh, capital schemes on an individual basis. And I'm, I'm interested to notice Councillor Barnes thinks I'm being optimistic because I thought I was being the opposite, to be honest. <laughs> Um, right, I've got a number of councillors wishing to speak, so we'd better get on with Councillor Mooney. 
Thank you, Chairman. I think the most worrying paragraph in this is paragraph 22. It's quite frightening, actually. It's almost as if we've given up before we start. Hence, the statement by the Deputy Chief Executive is very warming, and I hope you'll keep to it, because we need to keep monitoring this daily. It's so difficult. And the questions you need to ask yourself is, what do we do? You need to have those things ready. They're, they're levers. It's like driving a train and going into the buffers. You need to have those levers in front of you. Will we, will we cut capital spending? Will we deal with revenue? Etc., etc. And, uh, and And that's all I say. It's, it's all there. Uh, because it really is worrying, paragraph 22. You've, you've said it all, uh, Tony, there. Um, you know, and I hope, I hope we just read that several times. Thank I've you. Not, thank you, uh, Councillor Moon. I've not tried to hide from it, Chair. It is a, it's, a, it's not just paragraph 22. The whole report is a concern. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Councillor Maynard. Is that correct, Red? Fantastic. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think that I'm in danger of doing something I don't do very often, which is um, perhaps agreeing with something Councillor Cortell said, which is probably not his intention. But uh, without sounding facetious, a serious point is that time and again we seem to be looking at growth items for this authority. And I can remember um, in relation to specifically in terms of the budget last year, that um, we were talking about areas of search for cuts then. And I do think that as an authority, authority collectively, and I don't make this as a political comment, but simply a, a point of fact, um, I'm, I'm pleased certainly to hear uh, Lorna's comments about looking at areas of search, because I think we need to be honest, open, transparent with um, the residents uh, of the whole of Rother as to um, the situation that this authority finds itself in. And in terms of, of, of looking at Appendix C, C, I just want to confirm, and, and perhaps through you, Chairman, to Tony, ask a question. There's, there's no mention of the Town Hall project in, in the, um, the figures, the, the years as we go forward in Appendix C. There's no mention of the Town Hall project. So um, just through you, Chairman, to, to Tony Baden, can you confirm the spend to date um, on that project, because I believe that Cabinet was originally um, granted, a, a Cabinet a, um, made the decision to grant up to 480,000 in terms of the initial works, and I believe that we've now spent over 600,000. I just wanted conf confirmation of what we've spent thus far, and could he confirm why the project has now disappeared from um, any future years? Uh, is that project now... Is this the first time that we're going to officially hear it that that project is now abandoned? And, and could we have the costs of the project thus far? Thank you, Chairman. Ben's going to take that one, I think. So I was just, uh, just, just to say, yeah, you, you're right in terms of the original authorisation was around about, I think it was 460,000 uh, for spend. The estimated spend, I think, at the end of Q2 is about 667,000. The reason it's not in any future years is because it was never programmed beyond this year. So the, it would have been, had it, had it been approved for, for the full 15 million spend and obviously would have been put into the capital programme for the years going forward, um, but it's not currently projected to spend beyond this year because there's no authorisation to, to move on to the development phases of that project. So at the moment, it's still just within the pre-development phase as approved by, by Cabinet. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ben. I, I have to say, I think that's two meetings on the trot now. You've actually agreed with something Councillor Cortell has said. Um, I will uh, get the, <laughs> the correct appointment for it. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> um, uh, we got Councillor Coleman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Tony, for this. It is obviously impressive work, and I know, you, you know you put, you're all into it, and it's far beyond anything I could produce, certainly, in your the most qualified person in the room on this subject. 
Um, I think none of us here got into being a counsellor to, to make cuts or, you know, to do this sort of thing. And it, it's very hard to look at it, but we do we do need to be sort of honest and face the reality of this. Um, and with currently an, another austerity chancellor, you know, this isn't likely to change any time too soon. This is going to be our financial situation for a while, I think. Um, I agree with Councillor Cortell and Councillor Barnes around the um, pay award. Uh, as Vice Chair of Licensing, obviously, I oversaw the last um, meeting on this where I think every single option that we were presented with was above the forecast then. And I, I, I just wonder whether it's better, as Councillor Barnes says, to put a bit of buffer into the forecast with the knowledge that the next staff pay award is likely um, potentially to be more than the 3% for next year and then the 2% going on from there. Um, I think Councillor Cortell mentioned a percentage around 4 point something, which I thought sounded pretty reasonable. And I think it's better to over-forecast that and be safe. And then if inflation is fixed and actually it doesn't need to rise by that much, we've, 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 you know, we've got it there, then to face the same situation that seems to come up at licensing year on year, which is... Uh, well, we, we ideally would want to give staff this much of a pay rise, but because in the budget we only forecast this much, it would have to be an overspend, and that's always the barriers that we have to, to giving staff what is effectively the pay that they deserve. Obviously this year we've, we've gone ahead and done that, um, and that was quite a significant overspend, um, and I just wonder whether that, that, that buffer would be better put in now or in quarter two than... Yeah. <clears throat> Just to be clear, it's not the medium-term financial plan that decides the pay award. It's members that decide the pay award. I, you know, I could put in 10% if you want, but what that will do then is increase the problem at the bottom line. <clears throat> I put in 3%, it may be more, maybe less. But I, in, in some respects, that's not really the issue here. It's not, the, this, as I say, it's not the medium-term financial plan that makes the decision around what members, uh, sorry, what, uh, what pay award staff should receive. That's, done, that's a member's decision. Um, I can outline the financial implications of it, and I thought we did that perfectly well last uh, for the 22-23 award. I've done it here again for the 22-24 uh, budget plan, but I just need to make that point because it's not, uh, an, it's not me as Chief Finance Officer being mean. It's me as Chief Finance Officer trying to be realistic around what the, the pay award may or may, uh, may or may not look like. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair, for Tony's uh, response there. I, 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 I don't, I'm not saying you're, you're being mean on it. Um, I, I just think it's each year we, we seem to have this thing where the, the forecast has been less than what we're going for, and I, I wonder whether it would be better to, to buffer that a bit more. Um, the only other thing is if we are going to go down, uh, and this is perhaps more of a comment for members than for Tony, but if we are going to go down into a future where we are going to have to make those tough decisions, cutting services, cutting aspects of services, I think we need to really evaluate as, as a council where the, the key priorities are. What is the one or two or three things that if, I don't know, if a nuclear war happened, if, if the worst things happened and we really ha had to only provide one thing, what, what is that thing that we'd want to try and do? And personally for me, I'm, this will come as no surprise, I think that is shielding the most vulnerable um, you know, that's no surprise because the anti-poverty work. Uh, and I think, therefore, things like, for example, I know Councillor Cortell mentioned looking at the council tax reduction scheme. I think perhaps we need to be a little bit more tougher with our authority partners. Um, because obviously, if we were, for example, to re-add re the 100% council tax reduction, um, it would be East Sussex and other authorities who would be hit the, the hardest with that um, compared to us. But I think maybe we need to have a bit of a tougher conversation with our partners and say, well, actually, if this extra protection prevents someone from becoming homeless or falling behind on their rent, etc., etc., it may actually be a necessary measure. I don't know. It's something to look into. Um, but I think, I think that needs to be one thing. Uh, and then, obviously, we have our, as we'll hear later, our climate emergency, um, which is ever-present, and it is an emergency. And although it's not something necessarily tangible in a meeting like this, and it would be very easy, I think, to sort of say, well, let's 
forget about those stuff and let's do something else. I, th- I think those two things, protecting the most vulnerable uh, and facing our climate emergency, for me personally, would be where our focus needs to narrow in. And things that don't, don't meet those may need to be the first things that, that are questioned for, for the chopping block. Although personally, I'd rather not see anything on the chopping block. And I'd rather see a, a change of direction nationally um, to actually invest in local government and invest in, in communities. But that is where we are, Chair. Thank you. I think if I, I speak to the uh, leader of the County Council, I, he tells me some 80-odd percent, 78 percent or 82 percent of, of their entire budget is on vulnerable, protecting vulnerable children and adults. So you know, that's, uh, we think they do the roads, but there's not enough, not much left to do the roads. <laughs> Um, Councillor Dixon, you're the well, you're the deputy cabinet portfolio holder for finance. Is there anything you want to add before I sort of put this to a close? Thank you, Chair. Yes, and uh, I'm sitting here in place of Councillor Giovanni tonight. Um, yeah, I've made a few notes as we've as we've gone forward um, tonight. I mean, I think it's worth worth pointing out that really in the autumn statement there was nothing there for for small councils like ourselves. Um, and, and as Tony has said, the, the increase in council tax is really just peanuts for us. If it would have been 3% or £10, that would have made a big difference to us. 88% um, of councils have said that they are dipping into reserves this year, and, and Hampshire and Kent have already declared almost an emergency, the fact that they're not going to have enough money to see themselves through. So, you know, we, we've beaten ourselves up here, but it's not just us, it's, it's the vast majority of councils. I'm interested to hear what people say about, about reserves. My, my ballpark figure was about £4 million, so um, I do think that 10% is, is far, too, far too low, far too low. Um, but don't forget, of course, we always have a lot of money sloshing around the accounts that's not necessarily ours that we can use for day-to-day -day running to keep things going, so it's, uh, it's not always as bad as it may seem. I think the big difference sitting here today than we were probably sitting here last year is that we didn't foresee any of the issues coming down the road at us. Um, but, of course, this time we can see many, many more issues this time, and that's what's giving us the problem. The sharp rise in interest rates does make a big impact on future projects because, obviously, it makes them far less affordable or profitable. And also that Im impacts the property investment strategy because exactly the same reason. We're not going to get the necessary the returns because we'll be paying more interest on, on the money we borrow. However, the flip side of that is this emergency will, will affect everyone, so there may be some good deals that we could still do on property investment um, because there will be people who need to offload businesses and properties. One of the things that struck me when Tony was speaking is there's just so many don't knows. We don't know yet about this. We don't know yet about another thing. This is no way to run a council. It's no way to, to run councils across the country. We need a bit more um, information. We need a bit more certainty going forward. We're now in December. We're not going to get a revenue settlement to the end of the month. We've got to set our budget in January and start collecting the tax in April. It's, it is ridiculous. Um, revenue is our problem, as we know. Um, capital receipts, uh, capital is less so. And I think, personally, we need to be a bit more bullish on our, our SIL receipts and spend them much more on ourselves rather than offer them to everyone else. But that's, that's always been my personal opinion. And, of course, in response to Councillor Mooney, we, we can make lots of cuts, but then we would just be a council that simply exists. And I don't think any of us want to be just a council that simply exists for the sake of being here. We want to do things. And this is the thing that is most frustrating. And lastly, on the pay award, as a council, we need to come up with a better, better scheme. And I said this at, the, at full council when we made the decision. And really, where we're discussing next year's budget, we need to be then having a pay award that that happens very close to this budget, so we don't have nine months, ten months of change and uncertainty in between setting a budget for the pay award and actually awarding the pay award. So this is where we, we really need, as a council, to work better, as well as working better with, with getting fees and charges aligned with what money we're going to need as well, and all those changes I've, I've spoken about before. So apart from those bad tidings, Chairman, that's, that's all. Thank you very much. OK, um... Are we happy? Well, obviously on, on number five... Um, Sorry, can I move Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, reserves of five million or a third of the budget? A third of the budget. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. Okay. Um, Sorry, Jim, can I? Yep. yep. Clarification. A third of what do you mean by a third of the budget? A third of uh, the third, income budget? A third of the expenditure. Yeah. The gross expenditure. The Oh, sorry, the uh, I'm looking at your right. Sorry, sorry. I understand the the net the net expenditure. Yeah, sorry. Um, Councillor Cortell, happy to move. Uh, Chair, could I add uh, what um, both Councillor Barnes and Councillor Coleman have advocated that we have a larger provision for the staff pay rise. And I'm suggesting 4.5%. I suppose we can, we can push it through to Cabinet, can't we? Oh, yeah, I think that's, sorry, Chair. It's, yeah, I'll get, put it, push it through Cabinet. I mean, the, the report is for noting, and the, these are my, um, yeah, these are my assumptions, and, and it's my, my opinion. So I'm, I'm not minded to be tinkering around too much with the detail, if I'm really, to be really honest about it, Chair. And as, I keep, as I've said before already tonight, it is not the medium-term plan that dictates the budget, uh, the pay award agreement. I think what we do, if we can, we, we've got, we're just going to agree these and send them to Cabinet, and then Cabinet can make the decision. Um, and I think they're, they're, they're no, Councillor Dixon's here from Cabinet, he knows the feeling of, of what we said, basically. So, um, can I look to Councillor Cook, are you happy to propose the five with the with the, uh, the five points plus the council bars, it will be over third. Certainly, certainly, Chair. I'm, I'm happy to propose that we accept the officer recommendations with the modification made by Councillor Barnes. Thank you. And there's a seconded, Councillor Barnes. Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you. That's carried. Anyone against? Councillor Cortell. You're abstaining. Okay, dokie. Okay. That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, right, let's go on. Uh, item six, revenue budget capital program monitoring as at quarter two. No rest for the wicked, Tony. <laughs> we might have had enough of me by now, <laughs> Chair. Um, slightly less contentious report, uh, although still nonetheless important. It is, uh, it is for noting. The first thing I should explain is uh, as a slight apology to, um, uh, to overview and scrutiny committee. What I'd like to do, if I can, is try and get the monitoring report to go to overviews uh, first before it goes to Cabinet. Uh, but had I done that, um, we wouldn't have been able to get the report to Cabinet until uh, till December, and we'd have been nearly at the end of quarter three then, never mind quarter two. So I felt, in terms of timing, given the uh, criticality of the, um, uh, the budget position this, this year and, and all that's going on, I felt it was probably better to do it this way around. So... Not the way I like to do things. Uh, I still think cabinet, uh, overview would have an opportunity to feed ca uh, comments back to cabinet at the um, uh, at the next committee, I guess, if they so desire. But that, that's why I've done it this way around. I can only apologise, but the timing just didn't quite fall right for me. So uh, the headlines: the forecast outturn is approximately half a million lower than the planned use of reserves of 3.2 million pounds, um, and that's an, that's an improvement on the quarter one figure of 180 thousand. And here, straight away, you see that I've tripped myself up because the, uh, the forecast does not include the impact of the payable because I had to write the report earlier for, uh, uh, in, and I couldn't get that information in. So, uh, unfortunately, that will um, not put a dent in the forecast. Uh, but, I, OK, as I said earlier in the M MTFP report, we have got a budget contingency there. It is going to absorb inflation and, and the, the increase in pay costs. So it's kind of serving its purpose. Um, uh, the draft capital outturn is well below budget and again picking up on the point that Councillor Barnes made in the, uh, to the medium term financial plan report that this isn't an underspend as such it's just that we're not spending the money in the current year and it's more about timing of spend rather than uh, uh, saving any money on project spend um, Council tax collection rate is virtually identical to 21-22 it's a figure that I like to keep in the report um, and I think it's going to become more and more pertinent as we uh, progress through the year <coughs> and people's ability to pay council tax we have a fairly well, we have a very good collection rate at the moment um, but that may well be impacted by the cost of living crisis going forward and it's important that uh, that we keep an eye on that during the monitoring reports and um, the business uh, business rates collection rate, that's improved by about 14% um, year on year. That, that, that's not to say that we're getting a lot lots more money, it's just a timing issue. I will come to that in a bit more detail in a second, Chair, if I may. 
So the main changes to the, the forecast are explained in paragraphs 3 to 15. I won't go through um, every single one, uh, but some of the big items, for example, the Buckhurst Place rent, we, uh, I think that deal was concluded in, um, I think it was uh, April. Ben will uh, nudge me if I've got that wrong. Uh, but in terms of putting the, when we're constructing the 22-23 budget, we didn't know about that, that rent income stream. So that's, that's helped us out considerably. Uh, car parking income has improved as well as it's laid out in paragraph 8. Um, we have got a, a little bit of an issue with housing benefit overpayments and that um, the amount of money that we'll recover from overpayments of claims is much less, about 435000 less than what we budgeted. Uh, but this is a kind of a good news story and it has been uh, explained before. It's, uh, it's due to the uh, sort of success in how we process claims uh, initially, so we don't have so much in the way of overpayment to recover. But I do think it's an area of budget we will we need to review, and we are reviewing that with um, revs and benefit staff, at, not literally as we speak, but as we uh, go through the budget process. Um, financing costs, I think we kind of uh, talked about that, and the, the, the reduction is mainly due to um, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, time of spending the capital programme. But also, it is worth noting, actually, that we are also getting more... Uh, investment income than we initially um, forecast, and I mentioned that also in the medium-term plan report. We're about £200,000 better off than we were expecting to be at the beginning of the financial year. And I think it's important for members to realise that when we set the budget last year, the bank base rate was 0.1%, so we had no real way of knowing what that figure was going to turn out to be. So that's, that's come to our aid a little bit and helped us out. Um, so, so, yes, so the uh, collection fund performance, as I say, is a good story in terms of the council tax, but it could, uh, it could deteriorate as the year uh, progresses. It won't affect us in the current financial year because the council tax is set at the beginning of the year, and that's what we get from the collection fund. Um, so if we do have any downturn in collection, that will be reflected in future year's budgets, and we'll, we're doing more work around that now. Um, and the business rates, just to, to sort of tidy up that, uh, that sort of curious quirk uh, in comparison to, to last year's numbers, uh, the figures are correct. The, the difference is that with all the release that um, businesses were receiving last year, uh, it's kind of skewed the comparator. So you can't quite compare quarter two this year to quarter two last year. Um, I think if you remember rightly, in last year, quarter one, we had 100% retail relief, which then reduces 66% in quarter two. So it's a bit of a, a false comparison. But our collection rate, it is good to know, is now more in line with what it was pre-COVID level. So we should get some comfort from that. Um, and yes, yeah, so that, that's it really, Chair. As I say, it doesn't include the payable decision, but I think we can, uh, that has a part year cost of, I think it's about £145,000. We think we can absorb most of that through the budget contingency, or certainly some of it. Um, we will, as ever, work, continue to work with officers to try and drive the cost uh, of the overspends down further if we can. Uh, at this point in time, this will make um, some, uh, bring a wry smile to someone's face, I'm sure. I'm fairly confident that we can live within budget this year. But it's, uh, it, it is still a challenge and it's going to be difficult. Thank you. Okie dokie, thank you, Tony. Um, I suppose that with the budget that they had last week, where they mentioned, I think, hospitality and, and pubs and restaurants having a a change to business rates that's going to put the same sort of slight spanner in your works or not? No, uh, government have actually committed any changes that they've made in the in the business rate schemes and including the freezing of the, uh, the uh, multiplier rate, the government have committed to reimbursing local authorities for that, not through the business rates but through the section 31, through a section 31 grant so it won't be business rates if you like but it will be a, an additional grant so we should be compensated for any changes that government have made as a, as a result of last week's um, uh, budget announcement. Thank you, Dougie. Um, Councillor Barnes. Yes, first of all, can I thank Tony for answering four of my questions without me even having to ask them. Uh, uh, I, I, so I really want to focus only on paragraph 31 as a result. Um, I think as a committee that looks at performance, and this is not the fault of the finance officer or the finance department, but it seems to me we need to ask why uh, we now have a slippage of 112 million on the capital programme. 
that seems to be an extraordinary figure for slippage um, in any year. And um, it does suggest that we are actually not managing our capital programme very well. Now, I think we need to understand the reasons for that. It, clearly, that's not an answer that Tony Baden could give. I'm looking around, I can't see any officer. Oh, ben, ben might be able to tell us why we are slipping quite so badly and what we're doing about it to make sure we deliver our capital programme on time and on budget. I think to some degree it could be argued it's just as well we haven't got 112 million quid and then interest rates have gone up. <laughs> but, but, but I'm saying it's a bad thing in budgetary terms, but in management terms and in terms of the projects we want to see on the ground, uh, clearly there is a problem. Chair, if I may, Ben will, um, has also got something to add to this, but a, a large element of that 112 million will be around the fact, uh, will be around the, um, uh, the 80 million loaning facili loan facility that we have for the housing company. That, that makes up a big chunk of that. Um, ben, you might want to add uh, something else. I don't, I don't know if you've got anything else to add. To yeah, I think, I think Councillor Barnes is looking for a bit of detail as to, as to why specific schemes may not be coming forward at, at the rate we'd hoped. Uh, Tony's right, I think a lot of that comes down to the, um, uh, a, a decent chunk of that, at least comes down to the, the Blackfriars scheme, and that is it's simply conditions on the ground in terms of the construction of the road. That's been slowed up primarily through regulatory issues, making sure that we get the design um, approved uh, and getting that. Getting, getting the road design sorted so that it's uh, structurally sound in order to then come on, follow on, deliver the housing. Um, I'm sure Councillor Barnes, given his role, probably knows quite a lot of detail around that. With regards to some of the other schemes, particularly in the property investment strategy, one of the big ones, obviously, is the Barnhorn Road scheme. That has primarily been delayed due to negotiations over potential rental income with the CCG. Um, so it's been <coughs> hard to press forward with that scheme and bring it forward through the planning system without um, certainty that the rental income is going to meet the needs of the scheme. And we, we continue to work with the CCG to try and bring that one forward. Um, obviously, there are other schemes in the capital programme as well, um, but those, that's, that's the, probably the two big ones that you're, you're going to see the, 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 the large, large part of those uh, falls. Is that it? I think, I think to be honest, this, this has been through Cabinet, so you know, there's nothing much to add, really. Um, happy someone to move, move it, note it? Councillor Cook? I'm happy to uh, recommend that we this, this um, resolve, rather, that this report is noted. Thank you. A second for that. Councillor Cortell, all those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. None against. No. Good. That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, Next, item eight, program. Um, oh, I should have asked Councillor Dixon, but he's. No, there's nothing else. Let's have a look. Right. Um, progress on the environment strategy. Oh, You'll see we. Number seven, seven. performance report. Oh, I've clicked off number seven. I'm getting ahead of myself already. Oh, you're steal my Calm number. down. <laughs> performance report, second quarter, 2022 23, pages 25 to 36. Ben. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, I'm happy, to take, um, I'm happy to take questions on most of the paper. I just wanted to pull out a couple of the highlights um, in regards to uh, where we are. Obviously, um, I say highlights, but in some ways lowlights. The planning processing times are still on average at 26 weeks and four days. That is still including um, a lot of schemes that throughout the early part of the financial year were, um, were still sort of legacy schemes. So as we start to move forward, through, uh, through uh, the monitoring of this, we are going to see that number significantly drop. The, the current planning performance is, is, is at a level, as you would expect, for any, and is, is on par, I would say, with most other planning authorities out there now. Um, the, uh, the one thing I did want to raise is the, the bit around the net income from all investment assets. So just to draw members' attention to, I'm going to try and find it now, paragraph... Um, The uh, paragraph uh, 13 in the report, obviously the, the, the performance this year is going to be significant. And every, rep every report for the remainder of the year, we're going to 
completely outstripped our performance target because of the acquisition of Sainsbury's. I think what I wanted to say at this point is with regards to the property investment strategy, the £35 million that was originally improved back in 2017 is substantively spent. There's not, you know, there's a few hundred thousand pounds left now. Um, we initially had the ambition of sort of generating £700,000 of additional net income from that. Um, we didn't get the full gross income that we didn't anticipated. We had anticipated £2.1 million, but it's only £1.7 million worth of gross income. But we have benefited from three years' worth of, or four years' worth of very low borrowing costs. And so that £1.7 million is yielding about £850,000 net of borrowing, uh, which is sort of exactly where we wanted to be. Three of the acquired sites are yet to generate any revenue income at all, and that's uh, primarily because they were bought as development options, including the Barnhorn Green site, the Wainwright Road site, and um, the Mountview Street site, well, at least half of the Mountview Street site, the half that's not going towards the mental health unit. So there is potential, still within that £35 million, assuming that the development budget comes forward for, for each of those schemes, and those, they are viable in their own right, that that, that um, overall investment and yield can grow. But at the moment, obviously, with, um, with borrowing rates as they are, it's very hard to make these schemes stack up until we get some, some certainty and, and solidity in that. So, I mean, other than, other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. What I would ask is that given we've got the progress on the environment strategy to follow this, any questions with regards to the environment performance bit should probably be covered off in that because then it can be dealt with in the round rather than sort of picking up bits from each one um, because they are, there is quite a lot of crossover in those, the, those, those two sections. And so um, with, between the three of us, we can, we can pick up all the questions on the environment performance stuff in, in the next section, if that's okay with you, Chair, and with members. Well, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions? Councillor Cortell. Um, in Appendix A, on page 33 to my papers, um, in the section on housing communities, we've got um, a target of 60 households in temporary accommodation, and we've currently got 136. We've got a target of 1,200 households on the housing register, and we've currently got over 2,000. Um, I felt at the time we set these targets, that they were flawed. And uh, I said that uh, to a view scrutiny group at the time, and I still feel that way, that it's the just unachievable targets because they're far, far too ambitious in the current circumstances. And to have red marks on those two points on, on the status is just um, predictable. It's just not... It, 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 it just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a runner when those targets were set. I think, I think to be honest, the, 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 I'll bring you in a minute, Joe, but I, I've, I've always thought that the, the target of 60, which always, it, it always reads wrong that you've got a target of 60 people in, in temporary accommodation, so that if you've only got 50, it almost sounds as if you're going to go out and look for 10 to put in there to make your target. Um, is, is for budgetary sort of reasons. I think I think that's sort of right, or that's what I was told some years ago. Anyway, um, but Joe Joe can now tell me what it really means. I, th I think you're right, Chair. In, thank you, Chair. In, historically, it has been due to budgeting purposes, but in, in paragraph five of the report, it makes clear or tries to make clear, which is. Um, polite version of me saying I've never really liked this as a target anyway because for the reasons you've highlighted and, and that really it's you know in order to keep buoyancy and the morale of my team and, and, and for all of us really you know we, we need to be measuring performance on aspects of which people can control and are actually responsible for and we know that the challenges and the myriad number of uh, aspects and um, that that, that that impact on the number of people that become homeless are largely outside of this local authority's control and are driven by macroeconomic forces that, that we, we can have some impact upon. So my, my preference, in the, as, as demonstrated in the report, and articulated in the report, rather, is that we, we focus on homelessness prevention as a measure and try to maximise the number of home, households we prevent or relieve 
from becoming homeless, relief being finding accommodation for people already homeless and prevent, prevent them, um, and, and really focus. And that would be a real benefit for my service to try and instill a sense of achievement and, and, and morale again in, in, in that service, and, and for everyone here too, in, in trying to see and demonstrate that we are actually improving things, and which we are, as, as is, is, is demonstrated further in the report, that we are improving and increasing levels of prevention year on year, um, albeit in the context of more and more people becoming homeless, unfortunately. Lorna, did you, you mentioned in, in our briefing last week that you was looking at the way we report these, and, and is that something can you add on that and then see if you know, that ties up with Joe's thinking and, and how she feels that? Yeah, we, we're currently um, going through a process of looking at what, we, at what we measure and the targets we set. Obviously, it's members that set the targets. We propose those targets. Um, but through our service planning process, we've prioritised the performance indicator part of the service plan so we can take a bit of time to make sure we're measuring things that are meaningful and the targets we set are actually, you know, real targets um, and something that we can work towards. So that process is kind of going on at the moment. Um, I keep hearing the same conversation about some of these targets. So we, we, we do need to make sure that when we set a target, it's something we can influence. We could report things in a different way. We could report it as context measure or data only. So you've got that information without actually having to set a performance target against it. I think that's, that's a a good way of dealing with it so you've still got the narrative and you understand the context around the measures that we can influence but I very much agree with Joe that actually we should be um, focusing on the things that we have impact on and that is a, a better measure I think of, of performance so that process is going on at the moment and I think does it come back to overview and scrutiny in January Ben is that right it does can I on, on uh, Appendix A, we've got cost of temporary accommodation. Is, is that sort of like a, like a monthly figure of £1,201? That, that's an average, so it's a, a little bit of a blunt instrument, but it, it's a, a fairly effective one. It's essentially the mean average of, of per household that it's costing us. Seeing that the result is, is 1130 quid. So that's less. So, yeah. So we got a red. We got a red. So it should be a green. It should be a green. You're right. It should green. be a green. Well picked. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I'll tell the team. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I'm on a hide. Uh, <laughs> I'll go for Councillor Cook first. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Joe, this is a question for you. Um, the number of households on the housing register, given that this is uh, quarter two, is it end of August, um, which is before the real impact of the cost of living crisis began to hit. I mean, this is alarming that we have 2,000 households on the temporary, um, on the housing register, and we must surely be expecting that to be worse. What can we do? What can we do about it? It's challenging, obviously. I think, I think there's a expectations management piece here to, to focus on, is that we need to be honest with our community about the level of affordable social housing available and tailor our policy and register to a number that is prioritising against a criteria agreed by members, those in the most need, and not raising false hope in those. The vast majority of people, unfortunately, on that register will never achieve social housing. This is a problem across the country. You know, iterations, previous iterations of governments have been really keen to instill a sense of choice in, in the lettings, their approach to lettings and allocation of social housing called choice-based lettings so people can choose where they go, which does work in, a, in an environment which they are blessed with up in, in other parts of the country where there's a surplus of social housing. But in the southeast, it's it's a bit of a false premise, really. And, and, and potentially yeah, misleading on our population. Um, the answer, the short answer to your question is to build more um, housing. I wouldn't say just social housing. If we build more affordable ownership, shared ownership, for example, we build more market-rented housing, it brings first-time buyers out of the private-rented <coughs> sector and frees up 
private sector accommodation for those that that um, will probably rent their whole lifetimes. And there's the more direct route of affordable housing for rent. And you know we, we're at pains to keep this dialogue going with members and the community and our parishes that that um, there are different forms of affordable housing which have a different different are targeting different sections of the community, um, in, including um, for home ownership, building for home ownership as well, 100% home ownership. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a complex answer, and and it's not simple. It's to do with our local plan. It's to do with the way in which social housing is funded, to do with how finance is offered to the private sector to build housing. There's a whole range of challenges to build more housing. But that's the simple answer, is to build more housing. Lovely. Thank you very much. Did I see an indicator? Did, I, I thought I'd see Councillor Clark. I'll get Councillor Barnes in a minute. Councillor Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be quite brief. Um, I think we... Uh, should be under no illusions the uh, pressures that our housing officers are under and must be always looking at if they've got adequate resources. Um, I recently had supported a resident in my ward who was a new applicant to get on housing waiting list. She was told it would take 40 to 60 days for that application to be processed, looked at, and she would get a reply. Now, that's quite a long time to be, to be able to get on the housing register, so obviously... Our housing officer is under a lot of pressure and they receive a lot of applications. But I've got that in writing, 40 to 60 days to process a new application to get on the housing register just to get the, the application in. You know, so they're obviously under a lot of pressure. Do you want to come back on that one, Joe? Is that correct? Or? Only to, yeah, it's correct. And it's unfortunate that we're seeing that level of performance. It's another downside to having this, I would say, artificially high number of people on the register is that those those people often, um, our staff are spend a lot of their time having to manage the existing people on the register who are updating information, challenging their banding decision, wanting to increase their banding. How, how, how high was I on the last bidding round? That sort of question. Again, if we can bring things to a more manageable level, the team and manage the expectations of the public more effectively and, and be more realistic about the those that are actually actually going to get social housing at the end of it then we would also have the benefit of a register that was more efficient and cost effective to operate as well as you've highlighted it's too long to wait and it's, it's, yeah Councillor Barnes yes I wanted to go back to Lorna's review uh, because it seems to me at the moment we've addressed the targets issue by stripping out a lot of things over which we had no control and therefore there was no point in targeting. And a classic example is land supply, uh, which is something we have no influence on. It's not even really the fault of our planning system because we give far more planning permissions than houses built each year. Um, but the other side of that is, and I'm not asking for it as frequently as quarterly, but I think at least annually we need uh, to address some of these statistics that we don't actually have control over, therefore we don't set them as performance targets, but we do need to know about them, a kind of State of the Nation um, presentation. And uh, in some ways, I think the number of households in temporary accommodation is one of those. Um, what would be beneficial there is to know what difference our purchase of temporary accommodation has made both financially and in terms of reducing. Now, that buried away in there is something of a bit of a success story. Um, it came out of our housing working party that Charles and I uh, were engaged in before the last election. And it's been implemented and it's worked and it is benefiting. Um, similarly, the number of households on the housing register something we need to know uh, 
but what would be a realistic target around that? And I like Joe's suggestion that if we can show which ones we've prevented from becoming homeless, that actually is something we can do something about. It should be a performance measure. I rather agree with Charles. If, if we're waiting a, a long time, anything we can do to reduce that would be a proper target for us. Um, so I think we need to be very clear. The KPIs should be targets that we can do something about. But we do need a kind of state of the nation, probably annually, uh, which tells us what has happened over the year in terms of the delivery of houses, um, as well as not just the delivery of affordable housing. The other thing which we might have a look at, because Homes England are throwing a lot of money at the moment at um, housing associations. And at some stage, we ought to take stock on what housing associations are doing with that in our area and what it's doing to alleviate the housing shortage. Now, again, that is not something that you want quarterly, but I think at some stage, if we could have a, a session with registered providers to measure what they're doing and how they're moving things in the right direction, it will be very helpful to this committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely right um, that we need to, we've kind of conflated um, those measures that tell us something about, you know, the health of the district, the economy, um, things that are outside of our control. And I think a state of a district report would be an, an, an annual thing um, that um, we, we need to get it right. Um, it might draw in information, health data, um, sort of data that's out there, but actually bringing kind of those sore thumb issues to the attention of members. And they aren't things that we can necessarily directly impact. Some of our activities may influence those outcomes and I'm not suggesting we get into um, lots and lots of measurement around that because I think we can probably waste quite a lot of time doing that but to understand that some of our activities influence a bigger picture and a longer term outcome is important but this report should absolutely be focused on our performance on the things that we can change um, but I, I agree with that I think we used to do that some years ago a state of the district report so I'd like to reinstate that as something that we focus on going forward and take and separate out those KPIs from just measures about our, our district so yeah I agree Councillor Coleman Thank you Chair um, <clears throat> firstly just my usual point about the fact that the where the number of uh, council tax reduction claimants is lower than the target, just making sure that there aren't people out there who should be on council tax reduction that haven't found the scheme yet, especially because I know that we've added sort of self-employed people and the scheme's widened a bit. Just, I think it's one for members especially to make sure you're telling your community that the reduction is available for people who are, whose financial situations have changed and may now qualify if they didn't before. Uh, the only other thing is about what Joe was saying around um, the, uh, my brain's just gone blank, uh, what were you saying, Joe? It was it was really fascinating. So, um, <laughs> you're saying something, and I was going to say we need to do that. Um, that was that was the one. It, was it? Was that the one? I, I, I think I've just hit the time of the evening when my brain stopped working, so I'll stop talking now, Chair. Thank you. Oh well. Um, well, we're down here. What are we going to do? Um, resolve that the overview and scrutiny committee consider these findings and recommend any actions to cabinet as necessary. Have we any actions to re recommend as necessary other than Lawn is looking at them anyway? Is that right? Someone want to move that? Um, Councillor Coleman, you can move that. But before I move it, I just remembered what I was going to say, <laughs> Chair. Um, it, it was around um, the number of households on the housing waiting list uh, and whether, because Joe mentioned about Sort of changing, being more realistic about how many people are on that list and actually the people on that list being able to get that housing. Whether is, is that something we need to do as a, as a council? Is that a scrutiny committee thing that we need to set up or do we need to tell cabinet to set something up? Because some action on that would be, would be great. Joe? We presently are undergoing a re initial stages of a review of the allocations policy following a um, 
a sort of, I can't remember how they, the luck phrased it, the Department of Levelling Up came in and did a day with us to sort of review our whole service and, and the, the allocations policy was one thing I asked them to look at. And um, so we, we recruited someone to come in and do a review of that. We're just setting up a stakeholder group of um, BCSE, voluntary sector partners, to, to look at that with us and RPs to look at that with us. Um, we should have something coming up to scrutiny, I think, early stages of next year with a view to having a new policy adopted just before, probably, um, the, the election. Yeah, thank you, Ted. I've, I've had quite a few residents contact me sort of saying, I'm, this is my situation, I'm in dire need of a new house, yes, I'm banned, whatever, on the register. And it's quite heart-wrenching to have to sort of go back to them and say, well, actually... You are quite far down on the register, and it's unlikely that you're going to find housing, despite how you review your situation. Anyway, I'll, I'll move the report, Chair, for noting as well. Um, someone want to second the report? Councillor Cook, thank you. All those in favour? Thank you very much. It's carried unanimously. Um, now then, item eight: progress on the environment strategy. You'll see. Uh, cheers, Joe. Um, you'll see. Two new faces, I'm sure, from, from most councillors, or you may have heard the name, but you haven't seen the face. So, uh, so we have uh, Lucy and Elise here. So, um, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this report has been submitted uh, as an update of our implementation of the environment strategy. Uh, you're right, the last update was given to this group on the 25th of April, 2022, which was the week before I joined or the District Council as Projects Officer uh, for Environment. And within the last two months, I've been joined by my colleague, uh, Lucy Bolton, as the Environment Strategy Officer. So I'll begin just by giving a bit of an overview of some of the major environmental projects that have been um, in development um, over the past couple of months. And then I'll hand over to Lucy just to give a bit more of a steer on the overarching strategy as well. Um, so one of the... Um, most important um, uh, achievements, I suppose, since the, since the group was last updated, is that we now have adopted uh, an accounting tool for tracking our own emissions, our scope ones and twos, and we've been able to track that over the past three years, um, as was mentioned in the, the previous report as well. So we now have a, a framework for doing that. We have a rep reporting mechanisms, and that's something that we'll be doing annually to make sure that we're tracking our emissions. In terms of targets and what the reduction should be, that's where Lucy steps in. Uh, in, in just a moment. So really, it's just reporting about the fact that we now are doing that uh, for Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions. So that doesn't include Scope 3, which are the services that we outsource to other um, agencies to deliver for us, such as waste uh, contract. Uh, but in terms of our own direct operational emissions for the assets that we operate out of, we do know what our emissions are, so we know what we need to be working on in terms of reductions. Um, another one of the um, sort of uh, larger environmental projects um, is the Village Hall's Energy Project, which we will be using some of the SIL funding, uh, £500,000 of funding, to uh, improve the energy efficiency of village halls across the whole district of Rother, um, and trying to switch uh, away from, from fossil fuels and, and install renewables where we can. Uh, so that project... Um, was hoping to be completed by May 2024. We have stalled in the initial stages slightly um, with some delays uh, before we're able to actually uh, get quotes for phase one of that project, but we're hopeful that's going to be resolved in the next couple of weeks and we can actually get started on getting those uh, energy assessments done across all of those sites. Um, so I think with, with that sort of budget and looking at those sorts of venues, we're hoping we can make some really good uh, carbon reductions um, on, in that particular area, which will be really positive once we get that off the ground. Uh, we've also had um, a project in the pipeline uh, for a little while to install electric vehicle charging points in some of our own car parks. Um, so that um, council approved the procurement of a provider back on the 28th of March 2022. We've come quite far since then with some feasibility studies um, and we're preparing to apply for funding for installations um, across nine uh, Rother District Council controlled car parks, but that is subject to the DNO coming back uh, and confirming that the electrical infrastructure is um, 
acceptable mm -hmm. in those locations. So still not confirmed that we're definitely going ahead with those, but we're certainly hoping um, for at least nine Northern District Council car parks to have EBCPs by spring next year. Um, part of that is making sure that those uh, charges are available for residents that don't have um, parking at home, so they can use those EBCPs even though they are in car parks um, over night of an evening. Another strand to our environmental strategy is supporting our own uh, Rother District Council staff as a workforce to, to work and live more sustainably. And we've just run a really uh, quite successful campaign called Catch to Carbon Zero Sprint, which happened over the last 10 days in line with COP27. Uh, that involved staff signing up to receive uh, a daily email with a short video with some uh, advice about lifestyle changes they could make. And we had some brilliant engagement um, within the council for that. We had 75 members of staff, I think, signed up to that scheme. We also opened it up externally to, to residents of Rotherham. We had over 200 residents sign up as well. So still yet to have some of the um, evaluation back on that so we can actually put some figures behind uh, what people did. But we certainly had loads of engagement internally from members of staff, and that was quite successful. Um, and we don't want to stop there. We want to continue the impetus with that, and we're going to be um, developing a sort of comms and engagement plan um, across the year to make sure that we carry, carry on and continue to support staff um, to continue that journey to be more sustainably both in work and in their home lives as well. Um, in terms of improving sustainability within the council, we have now got the green team um, established, very well established, uh, meeting every four to six weeks. We've got about 60 members from across a, a range of different teams within uh, Rother District Council that, that come along that identify areas within their own service areas where they believe improvements could be made and we look at them as a collective to see what we can do to really drive down our emissions. Um, and we report um, obviously back to the Climate Change Steering Group as well about what we're doing around those. Uh, some of the projects we're looking at the, at the moment, for example, is improving our recycling rates at the Town Hall and also how we might be able to reduce uh, emissions from staff commuting to and from the Town Hall. So there's some of the areas of focus at the moment. Um, another project that relates to those Scope 3 emissions that I just mentioned is with the waste contract, and it was mentioned earlier about the switch to HBO fuel. Um, ben, I don't know if you wanted to um, comment on that particular project, if that's okay, Chair. Yep. So, yeah, as it was raised earlier, just thought a better cover off with, with regards to the hydrogenated veg, sorry, hydro treated vegetable oil, uh, which is a proposed exchange for the diesel used in um, our waste, uh, waste collection vehicles. So, we use approximately 336,000 litres of fuel um, as part of the Rother District Council collection. At the time of writing, the, uh, the price was 64.8 pence differential between that and what, you, what the, the supplier would pay normally for diesel. That went up about 20 minutes after we printed it and then went back down again uh, about an hour after that to give you some understanding of the level of volatility around that price. So th we're working on the basis of about 218,000 at the moment. A full report will be presented to Cabinet in due course um, because of the financial implications with regards to this, there is some discussion to be had with the um, uh, with with um, the the uh, contractor with Biffa to see about any potential opportunities they may have to help us offset that cost uh, in contract as well. So that's that's discussions to be had at a further time. The one thing I would say is that because we share a depot with Hastings, um, it requires both councils to sign up to this because they only have one fuel tank and you've got to fill it either with diesel or HVO. And if you can't get both to sign up for it, then it, it remains with it remains as is with diesel. So it's quite a complex thing. I won't go into too much detail on now on the basis that there will be a full and comprehensive cabinet report that follows um, in probably in January when we've got a bit more certainty around the discussions um, uh, in relation to that. But I just want to sort of put it out there seeing as it had been raised earlier. Thank you, Chairman. Back to Elise. Thank you. Um, so there are a range of other... <laughs> uh, a range of other projects as well. There is a full project summary that's been included in the report as well, which shows some of the smaller projects that we're working on or will be working on in due course. 
Um, and I'll hand over to Lucy now to talk about her role with the strategy. Thanks, Elise. <coughs> as, um, as the chair said, I've uh, been in post just under two months now, um, but uh, I've spent lots of that time getting to grips with our existing environment strategy as it stands, um, looking at the action we've been taking as a council, but also looking at the wider district and, and the emission reduction that's going on across the district. Um, as Elise has highlighted, um, we've got some fantastic projects that we're delivering, and we've also got a really engaged workforce um, who want to take um, or want to include environmental considerations in the work that they're, they're delivering, which is what we want. We need the environmental considerations throwing, threaded throughout the, the services we're providing. However, there are some clear areas of weakness in the existing strategy. Um, for one, we're, we're a coastal community, and there's nothing in the existing strategy um, about how we're going to enhance or protect our coastal or marine life. Um, there also is currently lacks an action plan. Uh, we've got the eight priority areas uh, with various pledges, um, but no time frame, minimal targets, um, and, and very little in terms of, of what actual emission reduction will be produced from those um, priority areas. Climate science has come a long way in the last two years, and so we need an ambitious, dynamic strategy and climate action plan this if we want to stand a chance of meeting our 2030 target. I don't want to be all doom and gloom because I do ultimately I think we can reach it. Um, but we've had an 18% emissions reduction as a council since 2019, as Elise said. As a district since 2018, it's about 14.8% reduction. If we want to reach our target or get to net zero by 2030, we need to be achieving that sort of annual that sort of reduction annually. We also, need to make, sorry, we also need to make sure we're protecting and enhancing biodiversity. We need to be locking up and storing more carbon. Um, now, new carbon capture technologies are being developed, but currently the best one we have is nature. So we need to be protecting what we've got. Um, and we also know there's a whole host of co-benefits that go alongside this with health and well-being, flooding and drought mitigation, etc. Um, I want to step. I want us to step up and be a part of the wider climate community and um, there are some councils doing fantastic work across the country and I want us to um, be a part of that, learn from that, be one of those. Um, prior to my arrival there was a discussion about rather joining the UK 100. Um, I've now picked that up. Unfortunately we heard back from a little bit too late to take to council this December but we can take it uh, to the following council um, I bring a paper to have full council approve our membership. Um, so to summarise we are rewriting the environment strategy. Our new strategy will be evidence-based, rather specific. It'll be looking district-wide across all emissions, domestic, transport, agricultural, commercial waste. Um, we need to look at this holistically. Um, and we need to work in partnership to do this. We've already started doing this. We've already started reaching out to the local community. We've already started getting their feedback on what's working and what's not been working, um, which has been really helpful. Uh, so as we work on this... Um, strategy over the coming months, we will obviously be continuing to deliver the projects that Elise has just mentioned and the new ones coming up to us reviewing and uh, creating our new strategy and action plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it's good to see the Village Hall project, energy project, moving forward. Has it come from this group in the first place? <laughs> Even so, it's tried to be hijacked by others. There you go. Um, vehicle charging points, yes. I, I go not by vehicle, uh, by bicycle into Folkestone Hive quite often. And uh, they've got a lot of vehicle charging points now going in. A lot of their car parks, I go to CAFs near. Um, <laughs> they've had the little poles for about six months, but they've actually got things you can plug into them now. So, so, so these things obviously take time. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the vegetable oil, I cannot get my head around why the vegetable oil is 65p a litre dearer. Because about 16 or 17 years ago, my old van, there was a place in Rye Harbour that used to do this vegetable oil. There was a, there was a food for supply and they used to collect the old stuff and turn it into biodiesel. I used to buy it, and it was about 10p a litre cheaper. 
the diesel, but it, it, um, it, you, you, you smelt like a chip shop driving up the road, so I gave up after about three months. Um, but, uh, but, but the way the fact is, dear, it just, just I, I can't get my head around that one. Um, to me, it wouldn't stack up, but there you go. Um, who, uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Gray, because Councillor Gray, this is, this is your bag, as, as the only sort of pucker green councillor, if you like, on here. So, so I'd better ask you if you've got anything to say. Uh, I, I hope you have. I would just like to say a big thank you to both Lucy and Elise to move the environment strategy forward. It's um, very encouraging. So thank you very much. Um, Councillor Cook. Thank you. Um, I think this is a wonderful strategy. Um, I really, really enjoyed doing the Couch to Carbon Zero. Um, I've still got my uh, assessment to do. Um, I'm appalled that of the 13 councillors sitting around these tables, seven of us are still using paper, while the rest of us are using um, our council-provided um, uh, laptops and iPads, which is the way we should be going. Uh, because especially as we print on pink paper, I don't think pink paper is very easily recyclable. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, we need to all be addressing that. Um, the green team, I'm really, really pleased to hear about that. I'm really enjoying the green alerts on Rother District Council's alert page. And I've used many of them. Um, at Battletown Council, we've just launched an Eco Youth Award, uh, which has gone out to all the, the youth groups in the town and um, I've used several of the green alerts for that, so I will let you know progress on that. Um, but yes, no, we're moving forward, and I'm absolutely thrilled to get your email this afternoon, at least, about EV charging points in Man Street Car Park in Battle. That's really, really good news. Thank you very much for all your work. Councillor Barnes. Yes, I think you'd be even more alarmed if it was paid with paper and weren't using it. Um, that would seem to be totally silly. Um, I'm perfectly happy to go paperless and use my computer. Uh, but if I've got paper, I'm certainly not going to not use it. Um, um, on the Village Hall project, I think it is worth just bringing out that this also will include the possibility of charging points um, because... I was aware when you're looking at your vehicle charging points that you're very backsfull oriented and that some of the larger villages are very short of charging points. The village hall is a very obvious place uh, to develop those. Most of those have got car parks. I, I think we need to think hard about some of these um, villages um, where the village hall is combined with some other building. Etchingham is, and I declare an interest as the chairman of the parish council, is linked with the school. For some god-awful reason, <laughs> and nothing to do with uh, the project team who asked for solar to be considered, most of the heat in that building comes from LPG. Um, and yet... Who's going to take the initiative there? Are we going to take the initiative or is county going to take the initiative? We need somehow to look at a building like that and say, why on earth aren't you providing a solar plant somewhere in its very extensive grounds? So can the Village Hall project uh, take a look at combined buildings and not merely uh, village halls? Um, I just wanted, I'm a little worried about the HVO project, um, partly because, uh, like the chairman, I'm not quite sure why this is a more expensive product uh, when actually it's recycled waste. Um, so it seems to me uh, we're encouraging people actually to at an unnecessary cost. Um, I'm also worried that it's very short term because I think within the foreseeable future uh, our waste collection fleet 
will have to be hydrogen vehicles. And it seems to me, um, if I were going to invest 200,000 at the moment, I would be more inclined to be trying to further some other project which has a longer term future uh, than this one. And above all, I'd be looking very hard at what we can do with hydrogen in a number of ways because I'm also getting increasingly worried about possible overload on the national grid. Um, and the national grid will be carbon free probably in two or three years, uh, but it's going to be facing a huge demand on its services. So I think hydrogen has got to be part of the future. And I don't think we're giving enough thought to that in this council. Thank you. First of all, I'll just address the, the first point about the village halls uh, project and those sites that are sort of jointly combined with, with schools, etc. Um, so during the sort of planning stages for this, uh, I reached out to all of the village and not only village halls, but community halls, any hall that, that serves the function of what a village hall would do. So, so also community centres that are in the more urban areas as well. Uh, outlined the intention of the project and what we were trying to do and invited the halls to come and participate. Um, one of the criteria for the project was that the energy bills are being paid by uh, some sort of charitable organisation or not-for-profit organisation. And unfortunately, some of the sites that are co-located with schools, because it's East Sussex County Council that ultimately has the uh, energy account, and, and they are not a charitable organisation as such, then they have been excluded from the project. So the one that you mentioned there is it, um, Etchingham. It's further complicated because I think that the building or the land itself is owned by, I think, the Diocese of Canterbury as well. Um, so when they were approached, they, they basically declined to participate because they just couldn't see a way through all of the different um, organisations that they would need to go through. So it was very much an offer that has been made. There were, there were some eligibility criteria, but the offer was made across all village halls. Um, but we had to base our criteria um, in a way that was going to make the project manageable and was going to make it fair and equitable to everybody that we were putting the offer out to. Um, village halls specifically, obviously, as outlined in, in the separate report about that because of the way they feature in the core plan um, and the way the, the funding works uh, around the infrastructure funding that was used. Um, so that was to address that point. I think the second point was about the HBO. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, if I may. Um, with regards to the HBO, I, I, I think... Now, I'm not particularly au fait with the technology, but it, it's a slightly different approach to your, 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 your sort of waste chip fat from... From the old days of where, yeah, even I used to remember smelling that as you follow someone, you know, in a white van down the road from time to time. Um, this is a, my understanding is this is specifically manufactured, but it's it's hydro treated, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's it's specifically treated to give it that additional energy boost that's required. There's no retrofitting required within the vehicles that can just be replaced with the uh, the, the diesel can just be replaced with this, um, and and on you go. It's an annual cost based purely on the price differential of the fuel. It must be said that it's recognised by the Joint Waste and Recycling Committee that this is an interim measure and that, um, you know, that eventually the technology will get to a point where either electricity or particularly hydrogen charged vehicles will be, um, will be possible. But that doesn't exist at the moment um, in, terms of, in terms of the ability to deploy on a fleet level like, like ours within an affordable um, budget. <laughs> Because the technology is not just not quite there yet. We have we, we are doing some testing um, on an electric vehicle without Hastings. An electric vehicle is unlikely to be feasible in a district the size of Rother, where you're talking about it having to travel a significant number, hundreds of miles, on each charge. Um, especially, you know, given the size of those vehicles and the weights that they look to carry. So, it is a it is an interim measure. And when I say interim, I mean five to ten years interim whilst the technology, giving time and technology to develop, come forward, and for us to be able to adopt it in future contracts. Just one comment. I, in some ways, I think um, the waste contractors need to get more active in looking at this technology. JCB are moving into hydrogen, and of course Brighton already has hydrogen buses. So... The technology has got to a level where I think if the waste contractors were encouraged, uh, they might begin to 
feed it into their longer term procurement plans. Zermatt in Switzerland have been running electric buses for 30 years. Um, just as a pointless bit of information, but there you go. Uh, there was a sticker on the side of the bus earlier in this year. Um, Councillor R. Williams. Thank you, Chairman. I just, just wanted to ask a question. To set an example, how many people could put their hands in this room and drive an electric car? Surely, if <laughs> that's I, just one thing, I do. Which I have a feeling that if you took the whole council, very few would drive an electric car. But still, um, secondly, the other thing I just wanted to comment was Councillor Cook's point about using paper. Um, there are many of us, well, not many, but some of us, who are not able to sit and look at a computer screen for the length of a meeting. And uh, I know that at least three of us, there may be others. So it might work generally, but you have, there are always exceptions to the rules. Thank you. Mm, what we got then? Councillor Gray first. Can I just quickly answer by saying that I'm not actually a fan of electric cars. I'm not a fan of cars at all. I think electric cars are better than diesel and petrol, but they are still cars. They still have a lot of um, a carbon footprint. Um, there's the lithium from the batteries. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I very, very rarely drive. I walk and I cycle. We have one car between us. And I, uh, well, we, yes, we have a car because my husband works. My husband works out in the country and he's a gardener. He needs to take equipment. So, yes, but I, we, I do use the train. I do cycle. I do walk. And I would like, you know, more of. Green, greener transport rather than cars, walking, cycling, public transport, buses, and I'm sure that's something you're looking at. I think with a minuscule amount of miles I do, I do about, my van is 10 years old and it's done 25,000 miles. My car is 23 years old and has done 79,900 miles. And my wife's car is 10 years old and has done about 28,000 miles. So... I am not going to spend half a fortune on an electric car as an ornament <laughs> to sit outside the carriage because <laughs> the batteries will probably go flat before I use it. Um, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that I think the, the additional the changes going forward to the strategy are, are very welcome, quite radical changes, I think, that will push us to make sure we can actually hit those targets or try our best to because it's sort of not an option to not try. I think, considering the science and considering the, the sort of threat that that faces us beyond 2030, um, as Councillor Williams has started the "put your hands up" thing, uh, I just wanted to ask members: put your hand up if you took part in the Couch to Carbon Zero. Just three of us. Um, I'd, I'd recommend you maybe catch up quickly while it's still on your iPads. No, I'm just saying I'd recommend you catch up quickly while it's still on your iPads. It was very informative. Um, are very helpful. There are some cheat sheets that you can print out if you want to use paper um, to stick on your wall. And, uh, it, you know, it's, I, I think we all need to be doing everything we can as members to be pushing this forward and showing as much willing as staff are because we're really the ones that need to drive this from the sort of political end of things. Thank you, Chair. I've got Councillor Langlands on the screen. Lynn, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I am here. Um, yeah, just a couple of quick questions for Elise, uh, quickly. Um, I just wondered, Elise, how many village halls there were that you actually made contact with? And of the 40 that expressed an interest, were there more that you had to actually take out of the possible program because they, they didn't meet the criteria? And the second question is, did we at any stage ask the village halls to give you an idea of usage of their halls, how much they were used and how much they would benefit from having the solar energy option um, on their buildings? Thank you. Um, so I, I, off the top of my head, there were very few halls that were not actually eligible, and it was mostly the ones that were 
um, co-located on school premises, of which I think there's only maybe two or three of, um, that, I, that I can recall. I can get you the figure if you want to know the exact, but it was a very small number. Um, there was, uh, and there was only maybe one other that declined because they were planning on demolishing their village hall as well and building a completely new one. Uh, so there was just a, it was a very small number. Um, it's certainly mo no more than 45, I think, that we identified at first, and 40 of those were, were willing to participate. Um, secondly, yes, um, there's been uh, a questionnaire has been sent out to all of the halls asking them uh, for specifics about how the, the halls are heated, whether they use gas, whether they use oil, um, how many hours a week they operate for, a whole package of uh, questions that we have asked in anticipation of procuring the contractor who will then go out and do the energy assessments because absolutely you need to be looking at we, we want somebody that's going to be looking at the fabric of the buildings the usage of the buildings and the existing plant equipment that's there uh, to make bespoke recommendations for each of those halls about what is feasible and what is the best way they can reduce their emissions and whether renewables are feasible um, so it, you know we don't anticipate that solar panels will be something that is going to be feasible for every hall we don't anticipate that having an electric vehicle charging point is going to be the economical or the right feasible choice at every site but every site will have a bespoke assessment made uh, to tease out exactly what is the best thing for them as an individual um, site perfect and, and presumably we're doing that assessment and that is a part of this budget for for the village hall project? Yes, yeah, so that's phase one. So the, fir the first phase of the project will be to get a contractor specifically just to do those bespoke, bespoke assessments. That's lovely. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would say that village halls, management committees, if they've got a decent car park, could quite easily contact an electrical charging person, company, and get one put in off their own back, to be honest. And then, then you, uh, I think then you get a percentage of the usage back as, as almost as a no-cost option. Um, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I, one of the reasons why I must say I hesitated about couch to carbon zero is the notion of getting an extra email a day. Um, there are many things uh, in that project which I think one can do and doesn't need to be inspired to take part in a competition to do. Uh, but I, I, I was reminded uh, that the trouble with digital communication is that has a very high carbon cost uh, cumulatively. The other thing which I think we do need to address, and hopefully now that East Sussex County Council has got its £41 million, is the bus services in the rural areas are not only largely non-existent, but where they do run, they run east-west. In general, uh, the nearest bus to us that runs to Hastings, none run to Bexhill, the nearest one to Hastings is at least four miles from my house. Uh, the nearest bus is one and a half miles from my house. And uh, I would think probably over 50 or 60% of my village uh, is that sort of distance from a bus service. Chairman, as it's been mentioned now, um, East Sussex, I'll obviously declare an interest as an executive member on East Sussex County Council. Thank you. Um, just to sort of Raised uh, John's point, we received um, a presentation at TV Sussex recently regarding the uh, bus strategy improvement plan and the deployment of that. Quite rightly, I think East Sussex are focusing, I think it's about half and half versus uh, capital improvements versus revenue reforms. There is a, a full uh, transport and environment lead member report that will be available on the East Sussex County Council website that details where that money is going to be spent. Uh, the capital improvements, quite rightly so, are looking at the high volume areas. Um, the outer Brighton areas that are going to improve transport and, 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 and uh, accessibility to buses for the, the most sort of used routes, if you like. Um, within our area, as in, as in Rother, we don't, we don't benefit massively in terms of the revenue side of things. It's primarily around the extension of services to existing services, which is sort of 
connecting, um, quite frankly, Bexhill better with Eastbourne and Hastings uh, along the 99 route, and then the number 98 route, which connects town centre um, upwards. There are other there are other benefits, of course, um, but they, those those services will be significantly extended. I would say that actually anything relating to buses at the moment is really tricky. If, you, uh, if you've ever had a chance to sit down with the chief executive or stagecoach of the 27 bus routes that run in Hastings, I think about two are profitable. So uh, they subsidise within their company an awful lot of uh, um, uh, an awful lot of the, uh, the services as well. So it's a challenging time for the bus um, for, for, the, for the buses. Thanks, Mike. Chairman, really, I'm afraid. The car and the electric bike will have to remain the future in our rural areas, and that's about half our population. Right, time's marching on. Um, Councillor Cook. Yes, I just wanted to make an observation. Maybe if they actually invested in the not so well used routes, maybe more people would use them because they were more frequent and more convenient, and therefore people would get off the road and use the bus instead. Councillor Courtell. Uh, thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Elise. She's made a fantastic difference um, since she's been in post. The chart she produces with everything that's um, happened um, uh, in the climate sector is absolutely brilliant. Um, I have a feeling that Lucy will be equally um, good, and um, I look forward to seeing her results in due course. A um, couple of points I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, on electrical vehicle charging points. Um, Bexhill is, has half the population of Rother, yet we are only designated to have uh, one, uh, sorry, electric vehicle charging points in just one car park. Now, um, my wife and I considered buying an electric vehicle. The reason we went for a hybrid was because we feared that there weren't enough um, electric vehicle charging points to, uh, and we thought it was too risky to uh, be marooned um, without being able to charge our car. So we use about a fifth of the petrol of a diesel vehicle, sorry, of a petrol vehicle um, supplemented by um, a battery. Uh, the um, other um, point, uh, sorry, um, couch, couch to net zero, um, I did subscribe for it. I tried to do it on day one. There was the most complicated uh, issue about um, changing your bank. And I was just reading and reading and reading. And it took so long to uh, plough through um, the stuff on day one. It really wasn't five minutes that I just decided I didn't have time to participate. Um, I would love to go through it in my own time at a slower pace. Um, last point um, about the hydrogenated vegetable oil. Um, great idea. I am just seriously fearful after what Tony Baden has said under the medium-term financial plan that if we go for that, we'll put even more pressure on our budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that, I think to be honest, most people who, who have electric cars have probably, well, the easiest way is probably to charge them at home, which is which is a lot cheaper than, than, than a third party supplier. And you we charge it at home flat, overnight on the, on the free juice. We have a flat, we can't do Well, then well, I bought a petrol one, to be honest, but that's me. <laughs> uh, initially, there was uh, a plan to prioritise installations at three car parks so one Bexhill, one Battle, one Rye. We're actually looking at nine car parks in total now for our funding bid, four of which are in Bexhill. So that's six chargers in four car parks. That's wonderful. Thank you. Right. I think, I think we've given that a good airing. Um, thank you to, to, to Elise and, and, and uh, Lucy. Um, 
That's Lucy, yeah. Um, Ah, oh, yeah, of course, I've got, I've got Council of Theory written down. As you've sat there for two hours, <laughs> you better have an opportunity to say something. <laughs> Thank you. I will, and before I start with what I wanted to say, I just wanted to talk a bit about, well, very briefly, about buses. Because I couldn't agree more with Councillor Cook and Councillor Barnes. I cannot see the point of spending money on enhancing bus routes, which are also served by a train. You can get from Eastbourne to Hastings on the train. I don't think you need a better bus, but you do need a better bus, particularly if you're going to be reducing emissions in rural areas from outlying rural areas to where the services are. And I'm always told it's very easy in urban areas because people want to get around them. It's exactly the same issue in a rural area. If you live on the outskirts of a, a district, you want to get to where the services are and you want to go on a bus, and it doesn't make any difference whether you're travelling past loads of houses or trees and fields. The principle is the same. And I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to put my shopping on an electric bike. Um, it wouldn't work. It might work on a bus. I'm not having so many panniers to get my shopping on an electric bike, so we do need a better bus service. Anyway, that's my rant over. What I was going to say was about the environment strategy. Um, thanks to the addition to the council's staffing of two absolutely excellent officers. Um, we're on the move. We got off to a slow start um, for all sorts of reasons, but a lot of groundwork has been laid over the past three years, and it is now beginning to show fruit, I believe, and demonstrable results. Um, the strategy is being rewritten, which is a good thing because, of course, things change. Technology changes, um, and the strategy has to be dynamic and change with it. If you look at the appendix, at the, at the green bit, the projects that have been completed, it really shows what we're doing. And a completed project in this context isn't something that's been gone and done and finished. It's something which has ongoing impacts, like the digital selection box, like the reduction in paper. Um, also, I just wanted to say something about HBO, which is hydro treated vegetable oil, not hydrogenated vegetable oil. I think I'm the only person in the room who sits on the Joint Waste Committee, and we have discussed at some length before we went down this route um, about hydrogen vehicles. And yes, we all think they're the future, but they're not there in the immediate foreseeable future. And as Ben said, this is very much an interim measure. Um, an electric bus was trialled in Hastings, which worked really well, but of course, uh, not buses, sorry, um, refuse collection vehicles. But Hastings hasn't got a very large geographical area. You would have huge problems um, with them running out of power um, if they're running around Rora Rother, which is why um, I, the, we will recommend, I believe, on the Joint Miss Committee, HVO, because not only is it more environmentally friendly, if you do run out of it when you're in some far-flung part, you can top your engine up with diesel, and it doesn't make any difference at all. So it makes the vehicles much more flexible and also you don't need to buy new vehicles. Um, and electric vehicles cost about four times as much as a standard refuse collection vehicle. So, and this is a really good way of dealing with our Scope 3 emissions because Scope 3 emissions are notoriously difficult to get a handle on because they're caused by us but not produced by us. So I think, I think it's, it's a good project and a good plan and we've had very many detailed discussions on the Waste Committee about this. In fact, we broke into working groups to talk about it and we've been consulting other councils who have gone down this route. And it's been very successful for them. But I agree with Councillor Osborne. I fail to understand why it's so expensive when it's a reused material, not something that's come out of the ground um, in a virgin state. Um, I, but then I have to say, um, fuel pricing defeats me completely. Um, because it all seems to hinge on things which we don't use. But that's a, a different argument. So, please, I recommend this strategy. I commend it to you. I think we're delighted with the progress our new officers are making. Um, and, yes, we've got a climate change steering group on Thursday when we'll be discussing this further and taking it further. Um, so, yes, thank you. Good. Right. Um, I'll ask Councillor Gray if she wants to move the note. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Coleman. 
All those in favour? Thank you very much. It carries unanimously. Um, thank you, uh, ladies. If you want to go, I will probably take the opportunity to do so. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with Jeff. It's just <laughs> last man standing almost. Um, agenda item nine, Bexhill Town Centre Conservation Area Task and Finish Group. Um, Bexhill Town Centre Conservation Area. Establish a work group comprising five non-executive members. Terms of reference and recommendations, task and finish group be considered by the committee. Um, I've got some names before we kick off. I've got Councillor Cortell, who is ward member, um, Councillor Earl Williams, um, Councillor Maidley. Sure, you sent you as a first or second one to send me an email. Yep. Um, Councillor Stevens from who covers Ryan Winchelsea, which is also a conservation area, which might be useful, and she's on the planning committee. And <coughs> Councillor Langlands as well. Um, so I think that, that's um, yeah, yeah. I see that. Yeah, um, Jeff. Anything you want to add? I would. I think. I think you said it very well. It's obviously you know is, is the next stage from the decision um, to, to form the task and finish group at the previous uh, overview and scrutiny meeting. Happy to answer any questions. Good. And I assume we're going to be, we will be inviting, we had the two people who came to our last meeting. Was it last meeting? It was from the Chamber and the... Yeah, Bexhill one from the Heritage. Chamber and one from Bexhill Heritage. They'll be invited as part of the, uh, the evidence giving. Um, we're, we're looking to try and do this in a single day, uh, the evidence gathering and, and the debate and recommend, formulating the recommendations will then come back with a paper for circulation to be approved by the, the group. I don't think it requires, it's not quite the same breadth as the health and wellbeing task and finish group, which is examining a, a significant number of areas. I think this is something that we could, we could probably look at and is best discussed in a single day with some recommendations and then it doesn't take up too much of the member's time or officer's time. And we can formulate some good, solid recommendations based immediately on the evidence given. And have we, have we got a rough idea of a date? I mean, just four quick task group agendas. Um, I think that the um, we put it we put something into the um, terms of reference. I think about anticipated stuff. We, we, we'll be looking to get it back to back the, the recommendations back to the March overview and scrutiny. Here you go, time scale. So a full day in January, February time. Yeah. And then a full written analysis by February um, with recommendations. Cool. Good, good. Councillor Cortell, if you're brief, because time is cracking on. First of all, I think we need a site visit, um, walking round the town centre conservation area for the group to get a feel of the windows we are talking about and the problems involved. Um, and I'm suggesting we add that to the terms of reference, or I should say to the approach within the terms of reference. Um, the other thing is that I've had um, a fairly detailed letter from the Bexhill Chamber of Commerce, and um, I'll try and summarise it in a couple of sentences. Well, I, think, I think if they're going to be part of the group, then... then well, they would like the terms of reference extended, and that, that would have to be dealt with here. I looked at that. Uh, that's fine, but rather than reading from the letter, if you want to just sort of make the recommendation in regards to what the terms of reference extension would be, we note the fact that it's come from from the Chamber of Commerce. But if it, it's you that's from you as the council councillor on the committee that would be recommending the change, so if you just want to sort of um, provide us with the recommendation, it can be discussed. Uh, essentially, um, they would like to consider the, us to consider the ne negative impact of tests on residences where windows are not being replaced due to it being in the conservation area. I think that possibly sums it up. Um, they would also like to consider the whole concept uh, of the conservation area in deterring investment um, uh, in, in um, the town centre. 
I think if that were to be included, that's a significant change in the scope yeah. of full redrawing of the terms of reference would be required. I mean, you're talking about fundamentally looking at the, the existence of the, the, the conservation area in itself. Um, I think that goes beyond a, necessarily a steering group of this nature and would be something that would require a much greater input and would have to be delivered and could only be delivered through the, planning, the local planning process anyway. Um, so if, you are, if, if, if the committee recommend, accept that recommendation for an amendment to the terms of reference, then I think we'll need to go back and to the drawing board and look at what this group will be doing in terms of how that then feeds into the local plan. I, but was, I, would I would strongly recommend against doing doing that. And it's feeding in uh, what have been sent to me. I, I, I think, um, to be honest, if we, if the Chamber of Commerce and Bexhill Heritage are on the group, they've given information, then uh, and the and the job of the of the steering group is to is to is to come up with a consensus, then then that's it. And if at the end of the day the the, the Chamber of Commerce don't agree with it, then well, we either throw it out the window or take a notice of it. Chairman. <laughs> Councillor Maynard. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Chairman. I think, I mean, we need to be very clear. We, when, we, when we set up, obviously, terms of reference um, for um, steering groups, and working groups, task and finish groups, whatever you want to call them. And people can get quite pedantic about the title sometimes. But it's really important that we... Um, fully embrace all the necessary stakeholders so we get to a quality decision. And I think it's really important that, I mean, I, that's why I asked for it in the first place, for those people to be included, both Bexhill Heritage and, in fact, obviously, quite clearly, the Chamber of Commerce. But I think that what Councillor Cortell has, has, has said, because I think that most of us have seen the email from um, the Chamber of Commerce, I think there is nothing stopping, while, whilst I accept Ben's comments about you know, redrawing the, the terms of reference and why we wouldn't perhaps want to do that. There is nothing to stop what, whatever the steering group brings forth to inform that local plan process at a later, later stage. And I would think that that would be inherent, whether it's in Bexhill, whether it's in Rye, wherever. I, I think um, you know having that sort of quality debate um, and, and very much focused on a one-day basis about those issues specific to conservation areas that we know concern local members, Chambers of Commerce, Bexhill Heritage, to name but a few, is really important. But I don't think that precludes the outcome of that then informing the local plan process. I mean, Jeff may contradict me, but I don't think it doesn't, it, it, there's nothing to preclude than that informing that process as we go forward. Because I think we all want to see um, conservation areas thrive in terms of seeing local businesses thrive. And we also want to see conservation areas enhanced. We can have both. And we need to have policies that do that. I think it's very, very clear. And I, and I don't think, as I say, anything that, that has been said in that, em, in that email won't actually happen as, as come out of that, won't actually not come out of that, of, of the deliberations of, of, of uh, as the deliberations of that working group as things stand, because quite clearly we then move forward to, to, the, to obviously your desired outcomes as a result. And, and, and to inform the local plan would surely be one of those. Right, I'm just aware the time is moving on, so uh, Councillor Barnes, if you're brief. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very chary about uh, preempting the local plan process, which is about to go out to consultation. And so that does give me some concerns. But I was even more concerned by your remark that two lobby groups are to be part of the decision makers that they should be giving evidence no. I you said I I will bow when I look at the recording if I'm wrong but I think the wrong implication may be taken from the way you phrased it they should not be part of the decision making process uh, they won't be part of the decision making process they're part of they will be part of the decision because we'll be listening to their information and that will yeah, be force right. a decision. But they, they won't be voting on our behalf, no way. Um, Councillor Mabley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Very briefly, um, I, with the exception of Councillor Barnes, I don't think it's necessary for us to go around the town again. No. All of Bexhill, we know it. We've, we've walked it. We've done it. I've done it with Bexhill Heritage. You know, I think we've done enough walking around Bexhill. 
Thank you. Especially in January. I would say that before before the last scrutiny meeting, when, when I knew this was coming up, I did meet with Councillor Hollidge, the East Sussex County Council and previous councillor here. Uh, and I walked around the area and he just showed me some of the issues. So I was up to, up to speed because I don't know, I live 18 miles away. So the end of the day is if, if, if members felt they wanted to have half an hour walking around with, with, with Jeff or somebody, they could turn up half an hour before the meeting kicks off just to, just to avail themselves. So um, I'm going to go to Councillor Bayliss, who sat there for two and a half hours waiting to speak. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Osborne. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yes, I, I'd like to say um, thank you to the officer for bringing this forward. I would have liked us, um, that there was a sort of extension of the, the terms of reference to include a sort of general um, review about how this might play into the local plan pl process. I mean, I've already um, sort of in my mind um, decided that one of the outcomes of the local plan review might be to have some sort of change uh, to the rules around the conservation area and, and, and windows. Uh, so I think it would be quite useful if that terms, if that, uh, to, to, if the task and finish group pick that up. Um, in, and, and I, and I'm sure I've read in, um, Appendix A that there's something in there about uh, the local plan and how it might how it might play in, uh, but certainly I would I would want to know more, you know, about the law, uh, the enforcement regime, um, because you know all the time we are seeing people or we're seeing properties where the windows are being changed without planning permission, and we know that. You know that we know that um, you know enforcement um, action is you know this is op this is quite a way down the list of priorities for for enforcement action. So it's it is really important, I think, that we don't you know that we, if we're asking people to, to or telling people they've got to put in planning permission uh, that we deal with this matter properly and fairly um, and. You know, I absolutely agree with the um, with setting up the task and finish group, but I do think it could, it could widen to to ask that uh, sort of that wider question about the local plan. So I, I would, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I exactly support what Councillor Cortell is proposing, but but something along those lines, I think, would be would be would be useful. And I note that you can't have uh, or there's it's open to non-executive members but i would like it clarified that uh, i would want to not have a vote but attend that meeting that day thank you i'm told you can attend the evidence gathering and it will be up to the members of the task and finish group whether they accept you to come in so you'll have a bit of lobbying to do. <laughs> so now the, the members of the group are now smiling smugly. <laughs> Whether they want to exclude a cabinet member or not. <laughs> Councillor Cortell. Just one additional point. I seem to remember an email from Councillor Coleman saying he wants to be on the group. Um, I don't know whether we can extend it to six to include him. I, I, did, I did say uh, if, if, if you needed me, Chair, I'd, I'd do it. Um, if, if you want, if, if, if scrutiny are happy to extend it to six, I have no objections. And, and the reason why we... Are you on the health and task, health and wellbeing? I am on the health yeah, and Yeah, I think that's probably why we prioritised the other members who weren't already on a, on a task and finish group. That was, no, I, I think it was just the, the, you know, sort of just fair distribution of workload, really. That was all. Yeah, I, I think that's the same, because Councillor Barnes indicated as well, and he's on the plenty of work, so the council may be local, if you know what I mean. Um, right. <laughs> right, recommendation, so... Uh, they the original recommendation. Yep, excellent. And we've got, uh, got the numbers, got the names there, Louise. Um, 
Cortell, Earl Williams, Maidley, Stevens, Langlands. Yep. Seconder? Councillor Mooney, all those in favour? Excellent. Carried. Thank you very much. All right. Last item, work programme. You'll see we've got the additional meeting next week, uh, temporary closure of Rice Women Pool, just a single item. Um, Chairman, point of clarity, and I'm sure members will, will like this suggestion, but I don't know whether we're allowed to do it. Are we allowed to have that as a virtual meeting? Constitutionally, I know the government were vexed about the issue of virtual meetings, but I think that was only through... Um, Now, if I'm told we can't make decisions with virtual, but then is there a decision to make? No, same scrutiny. Recommendation. See, if it's an update, why can't we have it virtually? In terms of what we've all been talking about in terms of climate change, do it all drive in for one agenda item? Seems to me to be, notwithstanding the importance of the agenda item, not, I'm not at all... I'm not saying it's one of the most important things for residents in Rye and East and Rotherham and elsewhere. Not at all saying it isn't important. But I think that in terms of coming in for one agenda item does seem to be a little bit daft. Right. If we've got a live stream, which I would assume many people in Rye and East and Rotherham may be interested in watching it, we have to be in here to live stream from here. And Chairman, what the purpose of the meeting is. Go on. So it was it was in response to the uh, to the committee's uh, request that uh, Ivan Horsfall Turner, who's the chief executive of Freedom Leisure, come and explain the rationale behind closing the Rye Leisure Pool on a uh, sorry the Rye Swimming Pool on a on a temporary basis over the winter. He was unable to make tonight because he's on a flight, um, and so he, he opted to say, would, would next yep. week be acceptable because the the Meetings in November and January are just well either too late or just you know full up already. So added the added in the extra date. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I just want to ask for him to come along. So <laughs> oh, well, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, so I think it's, that's it's, really important. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's just um, a shame it has to be a physical meeting. That was all. I think I think I mean given given that we're not I mean obviously the committee has to sit in order for there to be. Uh, for it to make recommendations. The committee in the building has to be core in order for it to make recommendations. That being said, any members who join virtually will still have the opportunity to ask questions um, of, 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 of Mr. Horsfall Turner. Um, so it's, it's, I suppose it's a personal decision. I think we'll ch just make sure with the chairman that there are at least, I think it's three or five, three or five members. I we'll, we'll check the core to make sure that we get core within the building. Um, to, to make sure that the, the, chair, the committee can make recommendations up to up to cabinet, but um, other than that, people are, would be welcome to uh, join from home. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thought this was the idea of the meeting with the chief exec from Freedom Leisure, and we had a face to face with him. And I think this we owe it to Roy that we we do it. He'll be sat in the hot seat. Um, I don't think anybody's suggesting we don't have the meeting. I was just making an inquiry as to whether it could, needed to be a physical meeting or a virtual one. I think it's a really good idea that we have the chairman of, of Freedom of Leisure because there's a lot of misinformation out there as well as um, factual information. And I think it would be really useful um, for us all to understand um, the issues around the, the current situation of the Rice Women Pool. Yep. So we'll carry on as normal. And if you really don't feel like coming, then... Go on the screen. <laughs> but I could be here anyway. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. Um, next one, um, 2301, 23, um, 23, 2301, 23, Christ. Um, draft revenue budget proposals, uh, review of housing, homing strategy, health and well being, leisure facilities strategy. Seems ironic. Um, <laughs> And then 13.3, 13 13 of March, uh, Crime and Disorder Committee received a report from the Community Safety Partnership, performance review, reform, um, revenue budget recommendations of on, on off street car parks, Tarsen and Finish Green Group, recommendations of health and wellbeing, Tarsen and Finish Group. And then the last one, called emergency procedures and report to council. There won't be much more than that because we'd be in further. 
that's the end of that. Uh, Councillor Byron. Um, Lorna Ford's work, is that going to be reported to us, and if so, when? Um, are we talking about the savings? Oh, the performance report. Um, that, that's a report that comes up in January. I think it routinely comes up in January. Yeah. Okay, um, if that's it, thank you very much for your attendance. Meeting closed, five past nine. Don't know about the rest of you, I'm starving hungry.